Okay. Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 22 of Talking About Horses. In these broadcasts, I try to bring you some of the best riders, trainers, horsemen, equine advocates, and thought leaders in the industry for tips, insights, and stories. You can listen at home, at work, in the car, or in the saddle, either through Facebook, YouTube, or by downloading the podcast from the iTunes store. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Gated Horse Interna international gated horse clinician, teacher of horses and humans, judge, writer, artist, educational video producer, that's a long list, <laughs> as well as friend of mine for over 15 years now, Elizabeth Graves. Liz has been a multi-licensed and breed judge for over 30 years throughout the United States and Canada. In addition to this, she's developed judges education, testing, and licensing programs. She's a popular invited clinician at such events as Equine Affair in Ohio, California, back when they had it in California, and Massachusetts, Horse World Expos in Pennsylvania and Maryland, as well as other horse fairs throughout the United States. She has had articles published in Western Horseman Magazine, Trail Rider Magazine, and a laundry list of Gated Horse Magazine's newsletters and other publications. Uh, yeah, so I tried to, I, we were chatting, I tried to do the math, and it looks like Liz and I have known each other for at least a decade and a half, closing in on two already. Um, so Liz, thank you so, so much for joining me for this broadcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's going to be fun. Oh, I think so. I think I, so. I love, I love this venue you created here. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, for anybody who's out there, uh, for the probably three people in the gated horse community that might not know who you are in the whole world, and for some of our listeners who maybe don't have gated horses that might not know who you are, in addition to the little introduction that I gave, can you tell us a little bit more about who is Liz Graves? Uh, really a horse fanatic of all horses, gated and not. <laughs> My history started, though, in 19, with the Gated Horses in 1978 when I actually moved to Virginia. Um, as a child, my mother had one. She actually had a Gated Appaloosa, not a Wakaloosa, but a Gated Appaloosa. And I was not allowed to ride it, and I was too young to know what, what it was. So, um, so when I moved to Virginia in 1978, my first introduction was to the Tennessee Walking Horse. And um, they just, I'd never seen anything like it. So it was, I was mesmerized and I had I'd never seen movements like that. It was so different from a simple walk, trot, canter. And so I started on this journey. But one of the other things that brought me to it was I was brought up with a very military and classical horsemanship background through my mother and my grandfather. And some of the riding styles I was seeing on the Tennessee walking horse was troubling to me because it was very opposite of what I had been taught and uh, about having a balance seat and even knowing, you know, working forward seat, having a balance seat. And so I was seeing some horsemanship that was troubling, yet I was seeing a breed to me that seemed as versatile as any other breed non-gated in the industry, but looking at the horsemanship to me felt like it was holding this great breed back. And so I really got involved, really got involved in the versatility of the Tennessee Walking Horse, and then all these other wonderful breeds started coming out, um, gated horses, um, as time went on, as the years went by, because the Tennessee Walking Horse and the, the American Saddle, I gated American Saddlebred was very popular too down in the South, and I judged them and trained quite a number of them in my young years. Um, but if you think about um, the gated horse and what I've learned now, there's over 72 different breeds of gated horses worldwide. Wow. You know, we, yeah, we kind of think that we here in America, you know, we're kind of the, the founders or the base breeds evolved from here. They did not. We, we have about 26 um gated breeds that are now in the U.S., some of them imported, some of them created um, through um, multi-breeds, but there are 72 and more gated breeds worldwide. They have been a part of history for thousands of years, and so that's what got me so um, 
involved wanting to learn this and wanting to learn what this thing called gate was, why it was, how come they did it. Um, it became a real passion and a real um, kind of insanity, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I get it. Horses will do that to you, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I kind of brought with my with myself in this from my base of stock horses because I grew up with quarter horses and Appaloosas and then bred and raised and judged thoroughbreds for a decade as well. And it was something new that had gotten me that I knew nothing about that really got me pumped up and excited. And I thought I could help. I thought I could help with some of the horsemanship issues I was also seeing mm. because I, you know, I'm really compassionate about horses. So I was seeing horses not happy. And, you know, and just as I thought, you know, quarter horses and other horses sometimes not happy. So the goal was to bring the education up and into the gated horse world. And it has been a wonderful journey. I'm telling you, <laughs> and I'm not done yet. <laughs> good, good. Well, and it's taken you, it's taken you all over, yeah? It has taken me all over the world. Yeah, yeah. I have been uh, taught in several countries in Europe and um, judged throughout Canada and judged through the U.S. And, you know, when the clinic stage started, you know, we didn't used to call them clinics. Um, we just kind of ed called them educational gathering is what they okay. were called. Even from the time I was a child when um, Monty Foreman was here in, in the Minnesota area for a year living with Jack Brainard, and right. so we would have all these educational gatherings. Granted, I was a little teeny tiny tot on a Shetland pony, um, but I learned so much, and so it's just been bringing all of that through my experience and bringing it into the gated horse and find where people will be okay with it and try not to offend. Sometimes you do, but try to help them and their horses and give them results. Right. You know, you've got to give results. They've got to be able to see and feel that what you're telling them is true and honest. Mm, so true. And I like what you said there about trying not to offend. And sometimes you will, but I think you're absolutely right. Because if, you, uh, if you're offending somebody when you're trying to teach them, you're just going to shut their mind off, right? You're going to close exactly. your mind and they're not going to be receptive to the things you have to say anyway. Yep. The door shut, the door closes. Just like if you get big with a horse. Yeah. You get too big with a horse, what do you do? You shut them down. Yeah, And absolutely. so now they're not listening, they're in self-preservation. Same with people. Right. When they feel offended, and some people choose to be offended, that's just who they are. But in general, if you try not to offend a horse and, and not try not to offend a person, you can keep things going and keep the door open and keep their knowledge and their curiosity going. Right. Right. So true. And, th and that's, of course, that's important when you're trying to share these kinds of things. So uh, 72 different breeds. That's that's I'm still rolling my mind over that. So I, I mean, I could probably name off the cuff maybe eight uh, if I was if I was really thinking. And I see a lot of gated horses actually throughout the year. And I, I blame you for my knowledge of gated horses. I give that I give everybody that caveat. I say, look, everything I know about gated horses, which is maybe three things, I know from Liz Graves. So, <laughs> so I need to. I definitely need to get with you more to to learn more about these. But so in these seventy two, tell me, or seventy two plus, um, what are some of the more rare breeds that maybe our listeners haven't heard of? Yeah, and I can't even hardly pronounce them. <laughs> oh, really? But people would recognize, like through Europe, they would recognize the name Dale and Fell, like the Fell Pony, mm -hmm. the Icelandic. Um, it's a European breed. It's not an American breed. Mm -hmm. right. um, the Highlander, um, uh, another European one, is the Norman horse. Um, there's a Bosnian gated horse. Um, hmm. So there's many, and then Asia, I mean, you've got another, what, 25 in Asia? Wow. Think about that, yeah. And so, and there's, like that. I'm probably pronouncing these, a lot of people would know the Morawi horse, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, and the Mongolian horse, there's a sandalwood horse, there's a Siamese horse, there's a Tibetan horse, there's a Timber pony, um, there's one called Tuva, and those are Asian horses, and then... The American horses, let's go, American saddlebred. Um, 
and I have never met, never seen one of these, but there is an Andorras horse, a Bolivian Paso, uh, uh, Campalio, uh, a Cracker horse, a lot of people know the Cracker horses, I've never seen one yet, I'm doing research right now on them. Oh, okay. I've, I've got a friend actually down in Florida that has one. That's where they're from. They're yeah. from Florida. Yeah. And then, you know, some common ones are the Kentucky Mountain Horse, the Mangalara Marchador, which is now in, in the U.S., the McCurdy Plantation Horse, the Fox Trotter, the Mountain Pleasure Horse, Pasapino, Peruvian Paso, Racking Horses, Rocky Mountains, Spotted Saddle Horse, Standard Bread, Tiger Horse, which is a new registry, mm. uh, Virginia Pocket Horse. I haven't met one of those yet. That's an interesting but, sound. <laughs> but then we have African gated horses. Really? Yeah, we've got like six of those. <laughs> so, and I can't pronounce any of them. <laughs> one I can, the Berber. I can pronounce okay. that. Okay. Uh -huh. Lani, um, the African Shalapard. Um, so we have six African horses. But the other thing that's really interesting, and this is something that my friend now passed, Lee talk, and I talked about a lot because we experienced it a lot and still do. Um, we have other breeds that are not considered gated, but we have what we see gates coming out in them. Okay, so now in some new research that I just got here, I have learned we actually did have some gated Arabian. Okay. So mm -hmm. Gated Arabian horses, and mm -hmm. I think there were two or three specifically. But then, and I've experienced um, a, a, some in the Boxshaw Curly, and I actually have a box trotter myself that has a little bit Boxshaw Curly in him. Um, as well, so that's kind of common in fox trotters. I've had several quarter horses over the years mm -hmm. that show gate. That's coming from the gated Morgan lineage in some of some of them. Gotcha. The Andalusian, we know the Appaloosa, um, the Canadian. You know the Canadian. Really? Horse, I don't know. If, yeah, and they're really neat horses. And they are. I've I've actually worked with a couple of those. Um, a clinic I did years ago in Massachusetts. We had a couple Canadian horses come in. Now they were not gated though. So is it certain no, lines of them that are? It's just certain ones that it pops up once in a blue moon. It's not. They're not considered a gated breed in any way, shape, or form. But every once in a while you see one come out somehow through the lineage that DMRT3 that mutated gene in the nervous system pops up and you get a gated one. And even in a Frisian hackneys, we saw gated hackneys. Mm. Once not, you know, we know, everybody knows we have gated Morgan. And then um, the Spanish Barb is also, or the Spanish Mustang of the Spanish Barb, when I would go to the Prior Mountains, um, we, Dave and I would travel to the Priors to study the horses and camp with them. And back then when we would go, there were still some gated ones left. I don't know if there are any more because there were mm. so few left. But those horses had a lot of Spanish barb in them. Okay. So they still existed. Um, you know, I've been told that there's been some thoroughbreds. I raised thoroughbreds for a decade, and I never had a gated one. But boy, would I have been thrilled to have one. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Absolutely. So it's funny how sometimes the lineage, because, you know, some of these breeds, as much as we will say that they're pure, when you get to world history and thousands of years of horses crossing right. and being shipped all over, once in a while, one will pop up where you don't expect it to be. Mm -hmm. And so it's really fun, but people don't know what to do with it. That's where gated knowledge comes in <laughs> and helps them. There you <laughs> go. If a horse has got the, the genetic, the wiring gene, what we call the wiring gene, and then has the confirmation for gate. You want to keep them working towards their gait and what their confirmation is for their gait and not put them in a shape that is not conducive to their confirmation. Or they become very unhappy mentally and then physically they will start breaking down. So understanding confirmation and working within any horse's confirmation, be it a quarter horse or whatever, you want to work within your confirmations because there are many within a certain breed. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important thing we've lost today. You know, it used to be um, through all of the judging clinics years and years ago, you had better know confirmation. And there were very rigid rules on the percentages of what you gave certain parts of the body, and they had to be balanced, and they had to be tied together. They couldn't look like mixed parts, but they could be typey within their breed. So you had to know that what was a good confirmation, but what was considered 
very typey and very common within that breed characteristic. Um, and we've lost a lot of that. And I think that's kind of giving us some problems in horsemanship because people don't know about confirmation, even though it was taught through 4-H and Pony Club mm -hmm. very heavily and through every judging program for, for years and years and years. But it's lost. And if we could get that back, I think people would have a better time teaching their horses and shaping them properly so they have a healthy confirmation or healthy structure for their riding because riding should make the body healthier, not deteriorate it. Right, absolutely. That's something I share with my students all the time. And it's a quote that I got from Charles DeConfey. He said, there is no riding in neutrality. You're either building them up or you're breaking them down. Exactly. Yeah. That is, that's a great quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of always joke when we when we talk about engagement and collection and self carriage, you know, I joke that we're either working toward collection or we're working toward navicular, you know. Um. Oh, there's another <laughs> one. And you know, here's another really interesting point that's happened in my lifetime through the gated horses. We're seeing we never heard of navicular and gated horses. It didn't exist. I, it existed in my quarter horse world, but now I run across so many gated horses that have been diagnosed and x-rayed with navicular. Really? And it's because of the upside down postures, ah, sure. horses on the forehand. It makes perfect sense, absolutely. Yeah, and so they're breaking them down, mm -hmm. and so navicular, is, it's not uncommon anymore. It's actually getting pretty common, Yeah. and has been for a while. Right. And that's a horsemanship problem, and that's a lack of knowledge. And so that's why we need to inspire people to really start learning the technicals of what a horse is, what a horse is supposed to be um, in, in health, and how to help support these postures. So they last us into their 30s. I mean, all my horses get really old. I've got a 35-year-old now. Nobody really? ever goes early here. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great, though. That's great. Wow. I love that. I love that. So now you were talking about the confirmation and how that used to be a big part within the judging, but that it's not now. What happened? Why is it not now? Honestly, politics. Oh. You know, you think, and it, in, in my opinion, this is my opinion, it's coming through the show world. And what happens in the show world, and the show world in me growing up, because I grew up in it with many, many breeds as a professional showing for clients, mm -hmm. um, gated and non-gated, was um, the judges were highly educated and you were um, had to be highly educated as well. When a rider entered, a, entered an arena, even as a judge myself, we were taught there's no head on that person. Sure. <laughs> Sure, right. No right. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And every class is a new class. You, you judge it so differently from the other. Um, it is that performance that's happening right in front of you right now. And then you clean your mind and you have a clean slate for the next class. Well, that doesn't exist now. There's a lot of what happened with so much money. Yeah. And money causes problems. Yeah. Um, in the show world, I mean, if you understand, if you get a world grand champion horse, that could be um, between 500000 depending on what kind of facility and all the services you offer, 500000 to $2 million in your barn the first year in income. Wow. Yeah. So there's a lot of politics and a lot of people taking care of each other and even kind of sharing the kitty to make sure that that income keeps coming into those barns. Gotcha. And so wow. money has created the problem. And so the morality of judging for the horse and the performance at that moment has become very minimized. Oh, and boy, isn't that within every breed, too. And that's such a shame. But it's, it's exactly what you said. And I think it's in every industry, right? When there's yeah. competition and there's money involved, we start to bring out the egos and the BS, right? <laughs> I remember when I was, um, I, I had a mentor, and he's passed away now, um, but he wrote many books, and he was the president of AQHA and the Arabian Horse Association probably three times, named Don Burt. Oh, Don, he, okay. And I, I was a child when I would show under him, and then he became um, somebody who helped me set up these judging programs for the gated horses, 
sophisticated horses because they didn't actually have judging programs back then. They would just pull judges from other breeds, gated or not. And he told a wonderful story about being on an airplane, um, going to judge a show, and he was sitting next to another man who was going to judge a goldfish show. No kidding. No kidding. Wow. They were guppy shows. (laughs) (laughs) But he talked about how the the judge was telling him, because we had this problem in horses, where they would do um, surgical alterations on the goldfish. No. Yes. (laughs) And I actually met a vet when I lived in Virginia who specialized in aquatic medicine and knew all about that. That's incredible. So when money comes into things, people have, there are no rules. They will do anything for a coffee, a ribbon, or money in their barn to keep the business going. (laughs) That's that's crazy. We're going to, we're going to have enhancements on fish that's wow yeah but I mean of course it's the same thing right because I uh, presumably then you would have specialty guppy and goldfish breeders and you yeah, know exactly. wow and, and it's just like I mean we know that we have had a problem with Arabian horses being surgically altered especially those that got I did a, uh, my practical in college at an Egyptian Arabian farm in mm. Virginia for my practical grade, and, and this is when the heads were getting very deformed and oh, extremely right. bitched, and they're more so now than they were when I was going to college. Mm-hmm. And But one of the problems was monkey mouth. Yes. You know, an overbite, you know, as a confirmation judge, you always look at the teeth mm-hmm. in a halter class. Right. And so you always look for overbite or underbite. Well, underbite, I never saw until I got into the Egyptian Ra- Arabian world, and that's called monkey mouth. Mm-hmm. And they would surgically alter to get rid of the monkey mouth. No kidding. No kidding. Wow. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's a, a, a lot of, um, I think about um, another one that's really interesting was the, the club feet. It mm. used to be uh, a club footed horse was never, I mean, you were shamed if you brought one to a horse show ground. Right, exactly. I mean, that, that was a genetic fault. It was passed on. Mm-hmm. And then they learned surgical techniques to help correct these club feet on these horses. And where do they end up? They end up in a show ring, a corner yeah. show. I mean, we had walkers that were doing, that were breeding double club hooks. Yet they, that's early on when they were full wow. of surgery and you'd never know. But then all the offspring, a lot of the offspring would show up with club feet later. Right, right. Yep. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Fascinating stuff. It, yeah, absolutely. Well, and that could certainly be a, a two-week broadcast in itself, how, it, how yeah. crooked <laughs> the industry gets, right? I mean, and it, and it is. It's, it's in every breed. It's in every discipline. It's in, unfortunately, but, you know, there's, uh, there's more. It's the human factor. It, it is. Yeah, it's that's, that's so horse, true. It's not the horse's fault. It's not the horse's doing. Right, exactly. In any way, shape, or form. Exactly. And, you know, I tend to feel, and and tell me your thoughts on this, though. I tend to feel that there are way more people in this industry that wouldn't do that, right? Oh, my gosh. Uh, no kidding. We and just I see a lot kidding. of them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, see a lot of them. You and I see a lot of them because we travel and do so many different things within the industry. Yes. Most people don't see these things or know about them. Right. So I'm going to say, you know, the icky part is 7 to 10%. That's nothing. Right. That sounds about the right. 90%, the other 90% are really hardworking people that um, they want to do something on their downtime. Mm-hmm. They love animals, horses. They're nurturing. Um you know, and they want to share it with their friends. Right. You know, what, and so that is the majority of this industry. Yep. But yep. also, these wonderful people can be the victims of that other 10%, and that's where we come in. It, exactly, because the other 90%, you know, they're trying potentially to learn or trying to enjoy, trying to whatever, and so they can sometimes fall victim to to their own unknowing, maybe, uh, unknowing. when and they get around the others. Fault. That's right. not their fault. That's not their fault. 
he knows well as I do, it is a lifetime of nonstop learning. Absolutely. To understand all of this. I mean, and, and we're still not going to get it all by the time we're out of here. Right. You know? Um, but maybe by them keeping them hooking up with really good educators, we can get their knowledge base larger, faster to help protect themselves. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. That's heck. That's half of why I started these podcasts so that I could get myself exposed to more knowledge, like you know, like you and like the other guests that I have on here. Because I know I can't learn it all by by uh, by accident or by trial and error. Right. You know. Yeah. It's yeah. Other, it's everybody's experiences put together that you learn from. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, oh my gosh, good deal. So let's go back a little bit and you had mentioned, so first I want to say um, I was reading your bio and you went to school in Stanton, Virginia? I went to many schools. <laughs> okay. Okay, I did my equine science at Blue Ridge Community College when they had a equestrian program there. Okay. Then I did my psych and I did my public speaking also in at Blue Ridge Community College. Then I did my human psychology at Mary Baldwin College in Stanton. That's actually where we live now, is Stanton. Oh, you do. Well, yeah. I used to, and I was also um, uh, taught at the cosmetology school. There in Stanton. No kidding. Well, I taught and I was their director of admissions too while I was training at night. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I yeah. went down to uh, Virginia Tech and um, I did a lot of my, because I went through in high school here in Minnesota, I went through the Ferrier program to Virginia, for, through Anoka Technical School. So I actually was a Ferrier for many, many years. Wow. Not okay. Time. Yep. I, but I did other people's horses and did all of mine. I don't do that now. I'm too old to stand under a horse. Um, but then I took, went down to Virginia Tech and took all my corrective barrier courses down there. And I also took all my camel with medicine courses down there. because I, I saw a deal about that, too. What was that about? Tell me about that. <laughs> well, I got involved in llamas. Because it okay. was lateral, it was another gated something. Uh huh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. And so I purchased uh, llamas to figure out how to train them because they were so different from horses. Yes. And I was not having good success. No. Oh. <laughs> because they weren't a horse. Right. And they were so different. But what I learned in the llama training, and even later, um, not long ago, the elephant training, mm -hmm. um, to adjust. You know, and see what an animal is and not put them all in one basket. Yeah, and yeah. So I went down there and took all my camera. And so I ended up doing that, then getting hired for some years, still training at home at full time, but working for an alpaca breeding facility okay. in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so I was training alpacas and delivering babies and <laughs> showing alpacas. That's fantastic. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a big yeah, it's been a big, vast world of experience. Right? That's awesome. That's awesome. And, you know, it, it was great. Whenever I was reading through your bio, I saw the the mention of the camelid training or the camelid education, and I got pretty yeah. excited about that because I, I, I don't know if we've even chatted about any of this uh, in the time that we've known each other, but I spent a couple years actually training camels to ride for some zoos. Oh. I have always wanted to do a camel. Oh. <laughs> I got one call from Pennsylvania after I moved back to Minnesota in 95 from some old walking horse breeders asking if I wanted to try to ca train a camel. And I said, well, I can't stay in myself, but I could set it up in my big garage. I had a huge garage at my other <laughs> ranch. And, and it never did come, but I was so excited. And I thought, I'm going to get to do a camel. There you go. <laughs> They are fascinating. They're fascinating creatures. I keep saying someday whenever I've got enough property, I might end up with a little personal zoo like that because, man, they're, yeah, yeah. they're, they're so unique as individuals, similar like the llamas, you know, but, uh, yeah, but different. I'm curious. Different. The one thing I'm curious about, though, with Ben Patrick is, is the, the, the wiring gene the same DMRT mutated, three mutated gene in our gated horses? You know, I haven't found an answer mm. on that yet. And, and, and same with the elephant, you know, because I have elephant training experience. So mm -hmm. I'm one I'm really wondering about the wiring gene. That's interesting. You know, that, 
that wiring gene, what um, Lee Ziegler and I always call it the wiring gene because they hadn't identified it as a mutated gene at that point um, in, okay. in the nervous system. Um, we know that keeps that creates the lateralness. So the giraffe is lateral, lateral, the camel's lateral, the llama's lateral, um, the elephant is lateral. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is how many dogs do you see that are lateral? Yes, absolutely. I used to have a couple uh, Siberian Huskies who would go into their, and I joked it was their Iditarod gate, but they would go into yeah. what, what looked to me like a pace. Um, and they could go all day long. So it's, yeah. it would be the same energy saving gate that we see in the pacing horses. Yeah. So one interesting thing though, that I noticed on the dogs, because I studied dogs in comparison, especially German Shepherds in comparison to Tennessee walking horses, and I've seen mm -hmm. the evolution of their conformation that's changed together too. That's it. I, I was just thinking of that as you were saying that. Interesting how how the, yeah. the underrun hips and the, the exaggerated yeah, shoulders exactly. came about very similarly. Exactly. So I'm really curious about if it is that same, same gene creating that. But then we also know confirmation is not, it's going to, the confirmation is going to tell you what gait they're going to be able to do. You know, yes. granted, all, all of them can probably do a stepping pace. Because if everybody inverts, look at how many non-gated horses even we see in the performance drop dressage arena. I don't know if you've had anybody say it, but I have over the years. Say, you got to watch this, this dressage performance. That's a gated horse. It's not. It's because it's so crammed and jammed and inverted yep. that it can't do anything else. Exactly. Attention. But it doesn't have the wiring gene. Um, but also, if you watch the dog situation and compare it to the walking, the Tennessee walking horse, watching these dogs that are lateral, when they go relaxed and lift their top line to neutral and get the base of their neck to neutral, then they go and do a four, a four beat walk. But when they lift and they're excited or they're brave, they go into that lateral. Yes. It's always from the top down. What is the top and what is the emotion also that's affecting the whole top line of the horse? Mm. Same with the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it make sense? It, it does. Like, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Where you look at you look at a llama, it's confirmation. You look at a giraffe, it's confirmation is built where the neck is straight up. Yes, exactly. So all it can do is lateral. It cannot bring it down to like an even four beat walk. But look at an elephant. Their structure is completely different. Their scapula is almost vertical. It hardly has any out, um, angle right. at all. Right. And their spinal processes in their spine, if you look at an elephant, their whole top line is round. Yes, right. So emotionally, when they are tight, they'll go to a pace. But when they're relaxed, they'll go to a flat walk and a running walk. But they cannot run. They can't run, and right. And they can't they, they can't, can't jump they either. Run. They can't jump either. Right. But they can do a flying pace. Hmm. Yep, Dave was on one that was doing a flying pace. It was a runaway elephant in Thailand. Interesting. Yeah, fascinating. That, that is fascinating. And I definitely want to get into, I want to hear more about that Thailand elephant project that you were part of. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get into that as we go. That's, that's fascinated me since the moment I, I learned that you were part of that. Yeah. So, yeah. so when, we, when we get into this, when we're talking about gated horses and we're, we're talking about non-gated horses, what is gait? What, what does it mean for any of our listeners that are out there listening? And uh, yeah, for all of us, what, what does it mean for a horse to be gated? Okay, so let's talk about a walk of any breed is called a gait. A trot of any breed is called a gait. Mm -hmm. A canter is considered a gait. Right. But they're not easy gaits. Easy gaits, okay. There's the difference is that we have a whole realm of gates that are really considered easy gates. They, they, aren't, they aren't a walk, trot, or canter. And when we talk about gated horses, we don't consider the walk uh, an easy gait. The canter is not an easy gait. It's a gait, but it's not an easy gait. So when we get into easy gaits, 
we have with different footfall um, sequences and um, aerial and support phase sequences. So all of your easy gates um, that makes them so smooth are, except one, are an alternating two-hoof, three-hoof support phase sequence. So it's changing from two hoofs to three hoofs. So instead of just two, 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 like in a truck with a moment of suspension, you always have two hoofs and three hoofs, so you don't get that moment of suspension that keeps it smooth. Okay. Now, now we have one other gait that is not that, and that is what we call the true uh, pure rack um, or a speed rack or um, what we would call uh, a pure tolt, not a saddle tolt, but a pure tolt, is an alternating two-hoof, one-hoof support phase sequence with a moment of suspension in between the trade-off of the legs. But the horses have to go fast because what happens if a horse stands on one leg for any amount of time? It's going to fall over. Mm, same thing when I stand on one leg. <laughs> yep. So it has to change really quickly. Gotcha. And do a suspension and jump to two legs to support it. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, but, but it's still smooth because it's so fast. Where a trot okay. is not fast like that. Right, right. That's where, you could get, that's where you get that upward lift in a trot is in that moment of suspension. Okay. So, so they're referred to as easy gates because they're smoother to ride then, basically. You hope. <laughs> okay, not, yeah, okay. Not all, let's talk about some of these gates because we talk about the running walk is the glide ride. And it is smooth. It's like when a horse engages into a running walk, which is a rolling transfer of the hooves, you feel like all of a sudden you're on a magic carpet. But, not, I mean, you're just, there's just no movement at all. But sometimes in confirmation, you get a walking horse that is um, kind of long back really long um, lengths and proportions in the hind leg assembly, like a long gaskin and a long hot to brown height, um, they get kind of a wave motion. So there's a lot, it's a kind of a wave back and forth motion, and it's not rough, it's just different. So you can have different feels within the same gait because of conformational influences. Okay. You know, so when somebody wants a walking horse, but they'll say, oh, that horse, you know, it, it really bothers my back. It may be one of those horses that really moves like that wave, where maybe a shorter coupled horse isn't going to have that kind of wave motion back and forth. Mm. It's not that it brings you out of the saddle. It just moves your bottom. Now, for me, when I have back problems, I like the walking horse with that big wave because it, it's the first horse I'll ride in the training stream in the morning because it loosens my back up. It actually doesn't tighten mine. Other people, it bothers there. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that you said that, actually, because that's something that I've always noticed is that there are some some walkers specifically, because I've trained a lot of walkers through the years, and I have a handful that show up to clinics throughout the years, and there are some of them that I, I will admit really make me sore. It's a lot of movement, yeah, and it's very different and movement. It's really loose, you know, because looseness is a part of that running walk gait. So if they get really loose and relaxed and they're really striding deep behind and then really covering ground in the front, I mean, they they will move your the base of your back back and forth. Yeah, yeah. For me, it feels good, but for some people, it does not feel good. Right. I tend to like it. Okay. But, you know, that's where you need to ride and not judge one one horse within a breed um, as being a gate you don't like. You have to understand there can be different fields within the same gate because right. of confirmation variable. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, wow. And I'm, I'm taking notes as we go here. I, I do that for all of our broadcasts. I, some Someday somebody's going to find this notebook from all these broadcasts and they're going to laugh at all the I've notes. I've got stacks of notebooks here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Not for, not for a podcast, just for writing articles and things 
month later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So, so now we know what the easy gates, uh, kind of, uh, well, a little bit about what they are. Um, and gosh, it sounds like there's only about 42 million of them. Uh, <laughs> so, it, right, right. So I've got a, kind of a two-part question. Um, the first is, how does the gate happen? And the second part, the part that's always fascinated me, is how the hell do you keep track of what they all are? <laughs> <laughs> that takes a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. So part of what happens with the gate happening, and we have horses that are very strong gated, and we have horses that are very weak gated. You know, and okay. everybody says, oh, I got a, 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 a gated horse, and, and it's not gating, and aren't they supposed to be naturally gated? Well, that's what the breed brochure says. That's what they're selling. Man, they sell a lot of horses that you just get on right. and roll and throw your legs forward and lay back in a chat lounge Ooh, chair. Right. Oh, yeah. Chances are you'll unsound your horse doing that, and you'll yes. really take out your hip sockets and your back to doing that as you age. Yes, um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I started years ago, I, I started a filly. I believe she was a Rocky Mountain horse at an expo in Pennsylvania. I, it was a cult starting deal I was doing. And uh, uh, I, was, I was told by a member of the audience, and I didn't remember this, but I was told later uh, by someone who was there in the audience, uh, I was told by this member of the audience that I was riding this filly wrong for her first ride, that I had to lean back and throw my legs forward. <laughs> and now they told me that what I said on the microphone in front of a pretty large crowd was, that sounds like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Uh, I can't imagine that I would have said something like that, you know. Yeah, but, uh, but it was actually when they reminded me of it, They when they reminded me of it, I I said, and here's why it's not right. I put myself in that position and she fell to the ground. I remember that part. She fell to the ground. And it was because she was very slight and she wasn't, um, she was not very strong. And it was a situation where it was, was kind of not the best situation. She was a little weak. And so I was really trying to be delicate with starting her anyway. Uh, and, and, you know, this was years ago. And I was kind of, I guess, trying to make a point about how there's really no reason to be doing that structurally for any horse, um, particularly on the first ride, you know? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, sorry, I'll let, I'll let you get back to that. So how, how does this take place? I believe I remember you telling me years ago that it had something to do with the alignment of the tuber coxae and the tubers sacral in the pelvis. Is that right? Is something in the alignment there? It's a, it's a lot more, uh, it's not more complicated, actually it's easier than that. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> okay, because um, the gate also, let's talk about the first place. Now you mentioned one thing with that filly. First of all, maturity. Yeah. Physical maturity, okay? And then the other part is conditioning, which takes time. And you know you can't get any horse in peak conditioning or strength until after the age of five. The taller the horse, the later that, that happens. Mm -hmm. So they have to have strength. But the other part is um, you can force a horse into gait um, through emotions. So let's talk about um, horse training and especially gated horses because there's some elements here that are really important. And it's really easy to cram and jam a horse. But no sure. one usually get a stepping pace, right? Okay. Okay. But fifty percent of your training on a gated horse is psychological. Mm, yeah. Okay. It's it's that on any horse, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's psychological. And so some really important things with the Tennessee walking horse and the fox trotter, they have these elements of looseness, relaxation. If they are not relaxed mentally, you are going to have tension. And when you have tension, you cannot, then you're gonna, a lot of times that tension is gonna go at that cranium and C1, mm -hmm. C1 cervical. Mm -hmm. And when it locks in tension, you are not going to be able to govern the rest of that horse's back all the way to the pelvis. Right. In a softness and a loose way, 
Okay, now you can cram and jam and get a stepping pace and maybe a saddle rack, and that's why so many people like those gates because they're easy. Gotcha. But they're not good for the horse either if they're if done incorrectly. So how it happens has to do a whole lot through training because just because a horse gates strongly in a field does not mean it will gate when you get on its back. As soon as you put headgear on it, Mm -hmm. You strap a saddle on it, mm -hmm. you change the emotions in it, mm -hmm. and how you sit and interfere yes. is going to interfere with whether that horse gates or not, or gates well or not. Right, right. We change a lot when we start to confine the, the <laughs> supraspinous <laughs> ligament and the back muscles, and then we add the yeah. weight. Yeah, absolutely. They don't know how to go into weight bearing posture. They don't right. know how to come up the forehand. Right. That's part of our job is to teach them their anatomy, because they don't know, they live with a sternum, but they don't know they have one, that they should lift it to help lift up through the withers and get that um, that C6 and C7 to a neutral position to get right. off the forehand to engage the hindquarters as much as possible. That hindquarter is your engine, that's exactly. your motor. Exactly. But if you're sitting incorrectly, like um, feet on the dashboard and back, mm -hmm. what are you doing to the longitimus muscles that will work right down each side? You're putting a crimp in the fuel line, and that's your fuel line to the hindquarters. I really like that analogy. Make everything as simple so the general public can understand it. <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm writing that one down. You put a crimp in the fuel line. I'm going to totally use that, and I'm going to credit you every time I do. I mean, it just, you, have to, you have to speak in terms that, that uh, Dr. Barm and I, um, my chiropractic that I work with here, we talk about never talk about your audience. Try to talk in terms that they can understand and relate to. Sure, sure, absolutely. Otherwise, you're dead in the water again. Right, right. Yes. Wow. So then when we're talking about some of these horses that are gating, uh, I, I've seen, so you mentioned the Arabs that would gate. I've seen through tension, uh, geez, probably every breed end up in some form of gait, some form yeah. of paciness. And we see a lot in our, I'm, I'm uh, primarily involved in the dressage horse world, we see a lot of our dressage horses with walks that are ruined, we would call them ruined, uh, by poor riding and, and overholding and tension coming through the back. They, they end up with lateral walks. So yeah, lateral walks. Yeah. Which is a lot of times, is, if you look at the head too, you're, you're seeing a lot of roll curve. But yes. you're also seeing a lot of roll curve in Tennessee walking horse in mm -hmm. every gated breed because people are riding their hands first. And yes. one of the worst things on a gated horse is your hands are a secondary aid. It's what you do with that, keeping that horse's emotions right, and then through your feet and legs, and keeping it soft, and keeping that back open and in a position, getting to the strongest part of the horse's back, which is the base of the wither. Yes. So you don't interfere with the hindquarters, and that they can learn to go in. A, they have to learn how to carry your weight. And even every spring, when your horse, I don't care if your horse is 15 years old, or 20 years old, every spring that it's been sitting in the winter, which a lot of people do here in Minnesota, mm -hmm. I know, but <laughs> they do, um, and every spring, people will get that horse up just like last fall and go on a trail ride, and go on right. a four-hour trail ride. Right. That horse is, has not had its back conditioned again to carry weight. Right. That conditioning element. You know, it may have been trained to, but it's still not there. It has to get conditioned. Just like the mouth has to get reconditioned every spring to packing the bit. It knows because it hasn't been. Same with packing a saddle. It hasn't right. been. So it, otherwise their backs get sore. Um, so there's a lot of things that people need to think a little bit more that they just don't know anymore. And so that's our job is to teach them. You know, take the time, reestablish the relationship in the spring. Mm -hmm. Make sure the emotions get them suppling. Do your stretching before you get on. Do your nice, quiet groundwork to teach them straightness again from the ground. Mm -hmm. And then um, start riding them slowly, you know, five, ten minutes, a few times a week, and build it up because it takes nine to 12 weeks to get up with a mature horse to get a horse in peak condition. That's riding four to five days a week. Mm -hmm. 
and people aren't putting that time in. Right. Well, and that's where, just as you mentioned earlier, that becomes, that's a horsemanship problem, not a gating problem or anything it's like not that. A, but it becomes a gating problem mm -hmm. because of the horsemanship problem. Right. Right. And so then, so often it's so much easier for everybody to just tighten up and cram that horse because they're having a good time with their friends. Yeah. And yeah. they forget the horse that's carrying them. Right. Exactly. Now, you mentioned when you first started um, becoming introduced to the Tennessee walking horses and that sort of thing that you noticed there were a lot of issues holding the gated horses back early on. Is that kind of what you're talking about? The horsemanship exactly. problems? The horsemanship problem. It was purely a horsemanship problem. At okay. least for me, because I was working with naturally gated horses, that's all I've ever done. But okay. what happened was the show horse world was influencing every facet mm. of the gated horse community because people copy what they see in the show ring. Yes. Right. Well, if it's getting a ribbon, it must be the right thing. It must, yeah, if it's a world champion, it must be the right thing. Yeah. Where there was no individualism. But, you know, that's the same with other breeds that are non-gated too. I, um, is everybody tries to do what we call cookie cutter training. This yeah. is what you do with a gated horse. Yeah. This is the angle that they're holding. All gated horses must have that angle on their front and that angle on their back. Right. And every, every gated horse is different. Every gated horse is an individual, with, even within the same breed. Mm -hmm. And that's where having a, a better knowledge base of looking at confirmation and on these horses and how to shape them properly a headset has always been a, a bad word for me. Yes. Because everybody tried to put them in a headset. There should be no such thing as a headset. Know your horse's confirmation, especially on all these different gated horse breeds. Mm -hmm. There's so many different structures. Um, and let the horse help you with you educate it properly and keep the emotions okay. Let the horse tell you where it's comfortable in carrying its head. Yes. Don't demand, and that, that's, you know, because you're going to end up in a stepping pace. So tell me about a stepping pace. What wh What is the movement of that? We keep coming back to that. Oh, yeah. yeah because it's the majority of the industry today. Oh, even okay. Fox, even in fox trotters. <laughs> okay. I'm running into some fox trotter training, tra um, trainers, people that have sent horses, fox trotters to trainers, and they got these horses going lateral, and I'm going, no, no, no. The fox trot is a diagonally influenced gait. Lateral does not figure into this. Why are you working on the pace to create fox trot? <laughs> so um, the stepping pace is a gait that it's a broken four-beat gait. It's not an even four-beat gait. Your running walk is an even four-beat gait. Your fox trot is a broken four-beat gait. Your stepping pace is a broken four-beat gait. So the stepping pace, the legs pick up laterally or closely laterally together. Okay. And then they start down laterally together. But what happens is the hind foot sets down prior to the four on the same side. And there is okay. tension in the top line of that. So what happens when you get a stepping pace or even a true pace is you get a tightening of one side of the back and then it switches to the other side of the back. The back is not lifting as a whole at one time. Okay. It's just switching. And when this happens, um, then a lot of the horse's weight goes to the shoulders and the hip on the same side, then it switches. Then the abdominal, the, the gut load, sways um, from the thoracics the same way, side to side. It is very hard on a horse's body. But granted, we can have stepping pace horses that that's just what their confirmation in, is, is bred to do. Okay? And some of them can be really smooth, and the really smooth ones we kind of term a slip pace. But then there are paces that, stepping paces that are very uncomfortable. It depends on the confirmation you're looking at within the horse. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm trying to picture in my head how how this is going to feel. So then, if we're oh. if I'm riding a horse that's that's going in a stepping pace, I'm going to feel then more a, a, side to side and and a pause, yeah. right? Oh, Almost like a a penguin kind of waddling side to side in a. Great analogy. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> from small amounts to bigger amounts depending on the horse. Okay. Now, if, you go into, if you go into pure hard paste, it's going to feel like your yes. internal organs are being rearranged. Yeah, yes. It's As my grandmother used to say, it's enough to jar your preserves. <laughs> okay. The only, the only paste that is smooth, and it's not completely smooth, it has a, it has some bumpiness to it because it does have a, a moment of suspension to it, but it's so fast, and that's the cool flying pace of the Icelandic horse. Oh, okay, if okay. Got, if you ride a flying pace on an Icelandic horse, and like I said, there's a little bit of bumpiness, vibration that happens. Um, that you'll feel because of that moment of suspension, but it's so minimal because the horse is going so fast. Gotcha. Okay. And, okay. And and that is a gait of that breed naturally, not in all individuals. I just sent one home that was a flying pace horse. And oh my gosh, it's a thrill. You want to put on a set of goggles and scarf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. I, I'm getting a picture in my mind right now of Snoopy as the red baron riding a riding an Icelandic. <laughs> That's perfect. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm back to riding my horse in the stepping pace, right? And I'm feeling wh what's feeling to me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Is that right? So it's that's right. That's right. Uh, hind and front, hind and front, laterally, right? So left, left, right, right. Left, left, right, right. Yes. Okay. How is that different from the from the running walk? actually just like um, a walk of any other horse except um, they go up a gear in energy they extend the hind quarters get deeper they okay. bring in the front legs but every leg is still picking up separately and setting down separately all the legs work independently uh, of each other in timing okay, okay? and, and so then we would have a more continuous have tempo within that Instead of the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, it would be the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yep, exactly. Okay. Wow. Okay. So now, now I'm starting to picture some of the horses that I've ridden in the past that have had stepping paces versus running walks. And I've, I've always joked that I can feel what the feet are doing, but I couldn't tell you what it's called. Uh, <laughs> Right. So, Terminology is a whole new lingo in the gated horse world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But let's talk about another gate because we talk about the Rocky. Okay, and yes. And we also want to talk about the um, saddle pole, which is the uh, same thing as the saddle rack in the Rocky. Um, uh, Corto Largo of uh, the Pasofino, which yes. is another version of saddle rack. So visualize this in that the legs pick up closely laterally together on one side. Okay. But when they come down, they come down independently. So it's an even four beat gait. Oh. That's the saddle rack? That's the saddle rack. That's the signature gait of your Rocky Mountain horse. That's your Koto, your Largo. You'll have a little bit different visual because of confirmation. Um, but it has the same, um, the same movements. But like a, a, a Fino horse and a Paso Fino, they have a shorter step. Yes. But a Largo horse in a Paso Fino has more extension. A Corto horse in a Paso Fino doesn't have the, quite the extension of the um, Largo horse, but it has more than the Fino horse. Okay. It even be. Okay, interesting. And there has to be what we call in these gates, in your, your, your saddle wrecking gates, what we call an essential tension. You know, there's yes. not that looseness, head shake, and head movement you have in the fox trot and the running walk. But right. there's an essential tension, but here is a really important part to know about these gates. A horse really well trained and self caring in the gate, and mm -hmm. self caring because of conditioning and good education. Um, their back should still be in what we call a level posture or neutral. And that's within the essential tension. Yeah, and it's because if they go hollow 
and now the horse is getting brave, we don't have a quality gait, the horse is going to start getting fatigued, you're going to start stressing and straining other parts of the body, you're going to start seeing hunter, hunter's bumps mm-hmm. come into the, um, the LS joint, mm-hmm. um, those things start happening. Um, so that's not quality, that's a horsemanship problem. Yes. Okay. And so the essential tension then is the, uh, the lateral contraction then of the longissimus muscle, am I right, uh, that allows the lifting together, uh, but then would relax for the separated uh, impact phase. Okay. Yes. You got it. I'm going to figure this stuff out. Come hell or high water, I'm going to figure this stuff out. <laughs> Yes. You know, one of the hardest things I talk about in learning gait is learning to see it is the easiest part. Once you know the elements, okay, okay. Um, of each gait, um, learning to feel it is actually the, the next easiest. Learning to hear it is the hardest. Mm, okay. So often people hear four beats, but they can't catch between a broken and an even. Gotcha. That's what takes the time, and it's really wonderful when you have a, a good arena um, where you could just close your eyes. I always say close your eyes to learn to hear the gate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And well, and you'd have to be able to pick up on the sound of the front versus the hind also. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's the same in judging sound. For sound is too in, in a horse that's mm. not moving sound around here. We, we try to do a lot of listening to seeing, to, to hear if a horse is moving soundly or not. Gotcha. You can hear, you can hear it in football. Yes, exactly. That's something I coach all the time with my riders. I, I, I tell them, look, can you hear that that left front foot is carrying a little more weight than the right front foot is, you know, and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they have to kind of learn also to visualize how the legs move. Close their eyes and visualize mm. how a hind leg yeah. picks up and rolls through forward and sets down in a support phase sequence. Right. You can visualize that with between the front and that's an old cavalry exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, to do that, they were all taught to do that. You have cavalry. Right. Um, then you start getting feel. Yeah. To, but on a gated horse, it's really important to you know, in naturally gated horse training anyway. Don't override them and stay out of their face. Really work so much through your your core, your intent. Because yes. if you start getting into the head gear, you're going to start messing with the gate, and you're going to start interfering with the horse finding it. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Because anything, any action that we put on the bridle is going to be reflected in the haunches. Immediately. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Immediately. So you've got to be really, really careful and really, really conscious. Of what you're asking that horse to do, and any horse, you do not want to lock that cranium in C1, or you right. are dead in the water. Right, right, absolutely. Okay, so I we're. Call that, I call that the, the master lock. You have to keep yeah. the, the cranium C1 is the master lock, and you have to keep that unlocked, or you're going to lock every other joint throughout the body or create tension in it. Yep. Do the rest of the lock. Yep, that makes so much sense, the master lock. I love that. And, and it's funny because I, I talk to my students quite a bit about how the, the occiput and the hyoid apparatus are the key to the rest of the body. So it's awesome to hear you say that that's the master lock. So. Yeah, because if they're, if they're hyoid and, oh, I can't tell you how many horses come in here, we're constantly dealing with hyoid problems. I mean, a pullback on a halter. Yep. can just face your hyoid. Yep. And anytime you have a hyoid issue and it's so fragile and it's so complicated mm-hmm. and the tongue sits in it, you know, and it attaches to your TMJ. Exactly. And so any tension you have in your TMJ, be it hyoid or whatever, or um, you could, you could tension in TMJ because you've got cervical that are displaced. Right. You know, um, then you're going to... That horse cannot give you its full mind. It's going to protect its head. Sure, of course. Of course, self-preservation. Self-preservation. 
information mm -hmm. um, to keep from that, that hurting. So, um, and the other thing is, if it, uh, a hyoid problem, a TMJ problem, um, an emotional problem, they're going to clench their jaw. Yes. And they're going to have a tight jaw. So they're not going to be able to pick a bit up properly and pack it, and they're not going to keep that loose jaw. So if you wanted to do something like cranial rotation, um, mm -hmm. Head twirling, I think mm -hmm. that's what Dr. Deb calls it. Yep, um, yep. Head twirling, where the jaws relax and release, and even doing it in your groundwork, because we do it, in our, we start that in our groundwork here. Yes. Um, head twirling. Um, you, you're still dead, you're dead in the water because you're not going to get the whole part. Right, exactly. Exactly. You know, it's just less is more, less is more. Soft and be a listener. Don't assume or take anything personal that a horse is doing. Always sit back and ask why. And then go to the body and ask, how is the horse reacting to what am I doing? Yeah. So what do I change? Right. What do I need to change? Not what the horse needs to change. What do I need to change? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And this emotional thing in gates with gated horses, if their head is not okay, and they don't trust you, or they sense your fear, or they may not trust you because you have fear, or they don't trust you because you're aggressive, you're going to affect the emotional element, and you're not going to get good taste. Right. And now I see a lot of times with the gated horses, and now granted, I see this with every horse, so it's, it's not just a gated horse challenge, but I see it expressed quite a bit in the gated horses, that when the emotions come up, they go ventrally flexed, right the back drops the neck comes up and it's almost like an avalanche kind of rolling downhill to try to catch themselves but then they can't catch themselves because they're rolling downhill you know exactly. uh that's so exactly right and that's where you often see when that starts happening I, I know a lot of gated horse people know this when that horse when that happens and it starts rolling backwards they'll start um buckling those hind legs Yes. So they like to collapse in a collapse in a hind leg. Yes. Yes. Or they will start stumbling on a fore. Right. That that happens a lot because people aren't keeping them straight enough. You know they don't have them mm -hmm. in perpendicular to the ground. So yeah, it's a, we we get in the way a lot. I mean, if we just uh, help support, guide, and direct, and not control, things would come so much faster for these horses, so much sooner. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a big part of it comes down to the emotions. Oh. <laughs> you know? Because, well, and with your with your gates, with, but yeah. Also part is, if I get a rehab, because I get a lot of re rehab horses here. Okay. Um, and sometimes it's, a, it's way more than 50%. Yeah. I mean, I have to spend so much time on um, getting the emotions and the trust and getting the defenses to go away that they believe in me that I'm not going to... I'm not going to hurt them. I'm going to help them. I'm going to, I'm going to guide them. I'm going to give them consistent, consistent rules and boundaries that mm -hmm. are reasonable mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. For them that right. they can understand. On an individual not basis. For me. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. That's so true. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, the tempo with with the gated horses. And I, and I always refer to the tempo as an emotional condition of the gait. Yes, um, yes it is. So that makes perfect sense that, that yeah. you're dealing with at least 50% of that being emotional. I know uh, we deal with that with, you know, our trail horses that are problematic, our, our dressage horses. Gosh, I deal with that. That might be closer to 75% emotions that we deal with there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I totally get that. Just get people back to um, the classical philosophies of the great masters. Yeah, right? Because they believed in that, emo that emotional training of the really good ones was paramount. They yeah. knew that. And those emotions, they took good care of. Yes. Yes. And it did not violate that horse's emotions. Right. Well, you know, that takes me, that, that's a perfect little segue to one of the things I warned you that I was going to be talking about uh, or that I was going to bring up. And that was one of the first clinics that I attended with you. I, I've got to see if I can find it on an old calendar, but I'm guessing that it was at least 15 years ago now. Um, you gave a lecture 
and I remember sitting down with a notebook and I have continued to be the nerd with the notebook at every clinic that I go to. Um, but <laughs> and so I blame it on you actually, uh, because that, yeah, your, your lecture really fueled me thinking. And I think so much about the footfall and the timing and the gates and things like that of all the horses gated or non gated. Uh, and I will admit that you had a large influence on that. Um, so you made a comment that stuck with me all of these years and has been a huge, huge influence on me. Uh, and it was, it was during a lecture where you were just talking about horsemanship. You were just talking about things and you had, oh, so many quotes that you were putting out there. And one that I remember that has stuck with me all this time is horsemanship is a place of being before a means of doing. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you exactly where I was sitting when you said that. <laughs> I mean, it was it was raining. We were in Ford City, Pennsylvania at the Crooked Creek Horse Park. Yeah. Uh, it was raining and so we were in the little tiny indoor uh, yeah. that they had there. It's long. It's a long one. Yeah. It, yes, tiny and long. long. And yeah. I, I remember we were doing the lecture just off of the the middle doorway. I can I can picture the moment exactly when you said that. Uh, it had that much of an impact on me. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? And for for anybody who's out there listening, I'm I'm going to repeat that because it was so to me so meaningful. Liz's quote was: "Horsemanship is a place of being before a means of doing." Yeah, I have that. Um that cold at one end of my indoor I have a classical indoor here at one end on a big side so hopefully it, everybody that walks out of the office into the arena sees that and they think about it <laughs> really oh that's awesome yeah yeah so um that place of being has to be a place of being uh, content mm. when you're around a horse mm -hmm. um of being able to clear your mind and be a listener of the horse and walk into a horse's face with no judgment, um, no negative energy, just being comfortable in your own skin, projecting nothing and mm -hmm. letting that horse and I'm not saying push into your space, but investigate your space and your energy, your bubble. Because I find if we put defenses, like if we walk up to a horse with stiff knees, where I always say, you know, introduce yourself with soft, open joints mm -hmm. and with soft shoulders. Don't project tension because the horse reads body language. That, that, how they communicate with that's you. all they have to go by yeah yeah that's all they have to go by so what is my body language so i have to be very conscious of my body language and have to really clear out who i am inside and be really comfortable to let that horse look deeply to me and investigate me i have some horses that lift their nose their muzzle and they look and they lift their head and they look right down into my eyes especially a lot of these rehab horses yes and they learn just be don't move don't react they're not showing aggressive aggression they just want to know how comfortable you are because if you are comfortable then you're going to give them comfort right if you are defensive or you are controlling or you are arrogant that horse is going to know it right off and that door is going to close. And so that horse is going to hold back something. You might get something done, but you won't get a hundred percent of that horse. And so part of being is being comfortable in who you are, being okay with your faults, um, working on your positives and kind of saying that to the horse, look, I'm not perfect. But I'm going to be here. I'm going to help you through that. Um, we're traveling the same journey, journey together at just a different time, because that's my goal as a teacher: mm -hmm. to help them to get through their troubles as we learn how to get through ours. And so, 
that's kind of a brief on what it is, but you just have to be okay. You have to find that internal peace. You know, and I, I do so much stuff. I mean, I sit here in the office and that, and I'm answering questions and phone calls constantly all the time, and I lose that internal peace. Mm, it's a busy, yeah. heavy things to do. Right. But when I walk down into the barn, and, and every morning, I mean, one of the greatest things for me is to walk out in the morning and hear this door open up at the house, all the way up here, they can hear it. And everybody talks to me. Everybody says, every horse goes, good morning. And I can hear it. I know all their voices. Yes. Um, and as you walk into the barn, it's peaceful. It's, they're comfortable. I know I'm doing my job in making their environment for them safe. So I know I've already um, started the day off right for them because they already know they're safe. Yes. And so when I go to work with that horse and walk into its space, it already knows it's safe. And it's my job with the troubled ones to get them there. Although I have to give my personal horses some credit here. Because my personal horses are so zen and so used to troubled horses coming in here that you can almost see the energy of them saying, oh, it's okay, just hang out, you know? Yeah, they become little diffusers. Yeah. Yeah, they, they definitely become diffusers. So they get kind of the credit because they are just being in their comfort as well to help the other horses that come here. Yeah. So, and as soon as I walk into a space of a horse, I make it you know, really, I got to do this, I got to do that. So when I walk into the barn and then working with horses, it's like the world melts, the world gets soft, the world gets quiet, and it's like everything else is melted away, but me and that horse I'm with at that moment and can get so zoned into that place that I, I can't hear anything, I don't see anything, just me and that horse. And the thing is having a good training environment that you can create that too. Yes. Because, you know, if it's insanity around you, it's not going to happen. Right. It's, yeah, no matter how hard you try. Yeah. Yeah, no matter how hard you say, I have try. There's one thing I talk about often is there are a lot of um, um, people places with horses, for the most part. Mm. You have to find the horse places with people. Wow, yeah, that yeah. is so true. That's meaningful. That kind of environment. And it takes that internal energy of a person to help that be for the horses. Yeah. You know, they're being inundated day in and day out with traffic sounds, with air sounds above them, with all kinds of energies and influences going on. We've got to help them feel safe in all that. Mm -hmm. Not safe. You have to learn how to tolerate that. <laughs> right. not the way to approach it. You know, let them look to you to help soften them and diffuse all the external elements that create stress in their life. Okay, so I'm going to dig a little bit deeper with this. And, uh -oh. and I love how you went with this. And it's become, since you said that, um, and obviously this decade and a half later, that stuck with me. If I, if I knew it word for word from the way that you have it printed in your arena, that's awesome. Um, one day I'm going to come out and visit with you and get a picture next to that sign. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait, honestly. We have guest room. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Per I'm going to find an excuse to come through that way for sure. Uh, so, uh, so we're talking about getting ourselves in that place. And this is regardless of gated or non-gated, right? This is horses. This is llamas, right? This is camels. This is, I've, I've worked with grizzly bears and lions and alligators and dogs and, you know, all of these things. This is when you're in an educational setting with any of these animals, with any of these people even, honestly, that, that pick up on our energies. So how do we get there? How do we go to this place of being before the public, means of doing? In a public event, it's very difficult. But, you know, one of the things that happens to me often, and, and I, I don't know if we have any of these people listening, but it happens often when I go and do a clinic, and maybe you have seen it too when um, I get a, a troubled horse in a clinic setting and you can tell the riders are nervous, which is normal at a clinic. We expect that. And, and so we try to diffuse that if we can. 
as quickly as we can, but we're not always successful because we don't know the history on all the people too that come to our clinic and what they're bringing beside and have projected into the horse. But it's so often, for me, you know, I know these troubled horses um, that I have to let them know I'm not going to be another human at these clinics. Yeah. It's just going to come in and take over their space. Yeah. And, and try to teach for the people. Yes. Teach for the horse. So you, you've seen me for years. I've used lavender. Yes, exactly. That's so funny because I was thinking of that when we went into this broadcast. And I was the so memory of you lavender. having it on your wrists. Yeah. All the time. I always, I live, we live with lavender here because I rely on the sense, the smell sense of a horse. So before I go into their space, I want them to smell that. Something different, something pleasant. Something that they're going to take up into their sinuses and release some endorphins to help them relax. And I'm not going to go and take the lead and rip them around. I'm going to touch them on the neck. And I'm going to let them feel my heartbeat through my hand. Mm -hmm. So they understand that I'm calm. And I and I stroke. I don't pat. I'm not a patter of horses. Stroke mm -hmm. that horse. And so many times the horses are so taken back by me asking permission to come into their space, doing an introduction, because that's an introduction I'm doing. Right. And then getting permission, hoping I'm getting permission if they're okay with me coming into their space. And then reinforce it with that soft knees, not a projecting harshness in my, my structure, but a soft one. Um, and an inviting one. I want to invite them. And so many times, thousands of times now, some of these horses will just look at you and they'll turn their head at you and they'll sometimes they'll take their head up and down. Some of them are like, oh my God, thank you. You're here to help me. That's yeah. the feeling that goes into your head. Sometimes and as if in disbelief. You. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like somebody's listening to me. Yeah. This person cares about my emotions, my body. It's not trying to own my body. It's asking if they can touch my body and help me show me show me how to use my body in a comfortable, pleasant way. It, it's very hard, it, but it's it's in a teaching thing. But it's it's been wonderful to be able to do that. Actually, yeah. <laughs> boy, it took me a long time to get there. You know, because you think as a young and up and coming clinician, because I can remember when this clinic thing just started, you know, so long ago, and you had to prove yourself because mm -hmm. nobody's going to come to the clinic. Yes, right. You know, and so you get in that place of, well, here I have to prove myself because, you know, if I can't do anything and I can't make this horse do anything, um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm done. I'm dead in the water. Mm -hmm. And we've had eras through our culture where um, people wanted to see that ego kind of how you conquer a horse and control a horse. Yeah. But the cool thing that I found is our population in the horse industry has aged. It's not young people anymore. Um, and it, it's older people and they want to be safe. Yes. And I found when that kind of element started coming to the clinics more, I got to teach the way I wanted to teach. Yeah, no rushing, and no hurrying. What, what I could do, yep, what I did at home, I could take into the clinic arena. Where at one time, if you didn't, if you did that, you were done. Right. You know, so it's been a really fun evolution to see this change. Granted, our population in the horse industry of people has, has, has dropped, um, and it's continuing to drop, mm -hmm. but the quality of people, people that are still in horses, really care about horses. Yes. It's not so much a status symbol or a thing that you just did, you know, on your past time. It, it, right. People really care about these horses. They really matter to them, and they want to be safe, and they want to know. So make the whole, show them how to make the horse safe, help them get through some of their fears because fear is a very consuming thing although we must have it for self-preservation right the horse. right survival um, survival 
So you have to be able to find your internal zen at a clinic. You have to find that a place of just being. And, you know, a horse will help you quicker there by a horse responding to how I approach them. That the people will. Yes. People will give me, oh, but this horse did this and this horse did that. And then blah, 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 you know, and they're bringing all their stuff in. Right. And you put your hand on this horse and you look in this horse's eye and it looks back at you and it gives you soft and the head drops and you're going, okay, now come look at your horse. Yep. Did you just see, while you were talking, did you just see what happened to your horse? Right. This is what I want you to do and I'm going to help you do it. Yep, absolutely. But they had that, they had that story in their mind of what was taking place. And, and it was a lot, and a lot of times it's their interpretation. It's not what it is for the horse at all. Exactly. Yeah, that is, that is so true. And I find that with nearly every problem horse, so-called problem horse, uh, so -called. that, that comes into <laughs> clinics. It's, it's simply a misunderstanding, you know? It's a misunderstanding. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and how hard, it can be so hard because you're talking two completely different species. Sure. And I always tell people, don't humanize your horse and your horse won't horsealize you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we talk about that, that miscommunication and that misunderstanding, yeah. it can be misunderstanding after misunderstanding after misunderstanding. I mean, if these horses have gone through multiple trainers and multiple owners and, you know, multiple clinics and things like that. Uh, and the, the tax always changing. The equipment, yeah. always, the, the rules are always changing. They're so confused and they're so traumatized. Absolutely. And so for them, it makes perfect sense to be defensive because they've been given every reason to be so. They have every right. That's why I always say don't take anything personally that a horse does. Yep. I never do. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I always make the joke to my to my students that they they need to be heartless in their training. And I and I say that because it kind of jogs their thinking. And, and what I mean by that is they need to keep their emotions the heck out of there. Get their emotions out of there. Just yeah. go blank. You know, there's something I do um, to get I get some really uh, scary horses in here sometimes. I mean, some really serious horses. I'm sure. Um, that are on the edge of going over and never being able to come, what I call never coming back. They're, yeah. they're done. They're, they're never, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. And so there's something where I just, I'll take my hand uh, at, on the front of their face. After I've done some introduction to the body and that, but then once they're trusting me, especially horses that have head issues, because so many do because people have been in their faces with mm -hmm. ulcers and bridles and that, and I will take my hand in my palm and I'll put it right on the center of the forehead and not wiggle a finger, but just not push, but just lay it there. Just be there. Yep. Just be there and not, but the secret to that is don't think. Don't expect anything. Don't ask anything. Like a meditative moment. Like a meditative moment. And just let that hand there and let that horse feel that hand of soft with nothing else projecting in your mind. And it is very hard for people to not have something in their head all the time. <laughs> yes, it is. Do I have to go shampoo my carpet? Do I have to be out of here this <laughs> time? Right. Um, and, and, you know, and you watch these horses when you do that and you do it right, they just melt. Yes. And they go soft and the head comes down and the eyes start close, start blinking and then they start closing. Yes. And they just get in this, this, just being place of their own. Right. Right. They go into that place of being. Yeah. They go yeah. into that place of being with you because you're making a connection of just being together. Yes. You know, this reminds me of, of something that a friend of mine uh, who is a surgeon and he studied Eastern medicine as well as Western medicine. Really awesome guy to chat with. But oh, he, he said yeah. to me one day, I used to teach a lot of clinics at his place. And he said, you know, we're called the human being, not the human doing. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I thought you would. I thought you would. And that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's another one of those things that just really stuck with me. You know, I yeah. thought, yeah, yeah. 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 Just be there. That's a, that's a big one. Yeah. 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 
Oh, I love that. Wow. Gosh. Oh, my goodness. We could talk about stuff like this, I think, all night long. Um, oh, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. I can't wait. I'm going to definitely make some time to come out and visit with you, Liz. And I know you have invited me. You've invited me so many times through the years, and I've never I, never made that opportunity come through. I'm going to definitely have to make sure that I do that. Right. So, well, we look forward to it. Oh, thank you. So do I. So do I. So. I can even cook. Oh, Awesome. <laughs> awesome that's fantastic that's how I relax that's how I relax I come in and cook at night oh that's one of my favorite things to do also yeah very cool <laughs> very cool uh, so talk our, and you can you can tell me no if you want to do this but talk to me a little bit about Lee Ziegler I know I saw on your Facebook posts recently yeah. that you've been going through some totes going through a lot of uh, yeah, a um, lot of when, stuff of Lee's. Yeah, when Lee um, passed, she left me all of her um, writings, but I have most of it. <laughs> After going through this, I, and I, this has been sitting in boxes for over ten years in my basement. I didn't open any of it. Wow! It was just too painful. Yes. Um, so, for our listeners, tell us tell us who Lee Ziegler was. Um, Lee Ziegler. Um, I, was a very world-renowned gated horse educator. She wasn't a trainer, and she um, and there's a reason why. And a lot of people don't know this whole history on Lee. But um, she studied. Her father was U.S. Cavalry, while my grandfather was U.S. Cavalry, and they both went Air Force together. And so when Lee went to college, she also went to Europe. And so while she was studying in Europe. Um, she also studied with um, some great masters over there, but she ruled um, Arabians, warm bloods. And when she came back to the States, um, she and, and married so really quickly right after she married. Um, she and her mother were in California, and uh, her mother um, had a serious car accident, and Lee's pelvis was completely crushed. Mm. And and so they had to rebuild her her pelvis and so she was never able to ride a trotting horse again but her father had a ranch and he was a fox trotter man and oh, okay. so she went to the fox trotters because she could ride fox trotters but she still couldn't train to, to help lee get on a horse she lived a lot of her life in a lot of pain because of that crushed pelvis and so when we um, get her. She'd have to have a mounting block, and she she'd have to get on the off side of the horse, and then have to lift her left leg over the back of the saddle to get on. Um, so, um, so she wasn't able to train, but she was a phenomenal teacher, especially since she had studied with some really great great people in Europe. Um, and she was highly educated, so she was a fabulous writer too, and she had. That really good, which really good trainers and um, people that analyze and are in fine mechanics and locomotion confirmation and what we call a really good 3D visual, naturally. Okay. So she had that as well. And so she went um, to Fox Trotters and then got very involved in the gated horses as her father was. And so when she passed, I not only, I didn't know this, it's been sitting in my basement for 10 years. Um, the colonel sent me all of his writings, and he was a vast writer and correspondent. I have correspondence here from all over the world, from um, Texas A&M and Kentucky Research and people from all over the world on gates and biomechanics and locomotion and, um, and all these studies. I mean, I, it's all sitting here in my office on a table. So wow. Well, I, I remember reading your post about that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, now, how long ago were, were those correspondences? Oh, my gosh. They probably go, they, these are going back to the 1960s. Nice. Wow. Yeah. I mean, with old world renowned people that nobody knows anymore. Uh, and and I, there's tons even here on the Gated Arabians. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I mean, I'm, there is, there's so much here in a, and on the genetics and um, of gated horses and the gates of gated horses. Um, 
am sitting here with a museum around me. Of, I, I can't believe what I've got sitting here. And, wow. and so I'm right now, it's on my table because I'm going through um, sorting and cataloging everything. And so I have most of Lee's work here. I haven't found anything new that I okay. didn't already have. Mm -hmm. um, but what her father sent is amazing. And I only have one of Lee's books. But her father had a, quite a huge library. But when Lee passed, her father, um, Colonel Bradbury, put his books with her books. Because she and I, when I would go out there, we'd sit and dig in all of her books. Because she's like me. She had a huge um, equine library, like I do. And I have okay. one Calvary book she actually gave me on one of my trips out there. I still have. But, um, uh, so he donated. So I didn't get any of his books because he's got a lot of books that he refers to of things that he quotes out of books out of his library in his correspondences. And, but he donated his books, equine books, not his Air Force books, his equine books, with Lee's and there at the Kentucky Horse Park. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. They were all donated to the Kentucky Horse Park. And so um, a lot of people, um, and there was some confusion, um, but when Lee got sick, um, a lot of people were supposed to, uh, well, thought the first two weeks they had diagnosed her with Lou Gehrig's because it mimicked Lou Gehrig's. Mm -hmm. And that is not what she passed from. It turned out that she had Lyme's and she had probably had Lyme's disease for many, many years. No kidding. Because when she and I, were, and it got so when she and I, um, we judged and did clinics a lot together and, and it'd be after it, she could only do a couple a year because it take her two months to heal she'd be so sick she'd be so oh. ill and that turned out it was the line that was making her so ill in so many ways on top of having a lot of physical pain as she aged from the crushed pelvis mm, sure sure um but one of the um things that she she wrote Doxy, and she rode a saddle I could not ride. I rode it, and I felt like I just gave birth to triplets. <laughs> because, of, because of her broken pelvis, she had to have a very, very wide saddle in the front. So she rode an old ballast. Oh, okay. Okay, the old Monty Foreman yeah. saddles. Yeah. And, yeah. And, but it was so wide in front. And all my saddles, the ground seat has to be carved out very narrow okay. in front. Mm -hmm. My seat bones are so close together, I didn't have a crushed pelvis. Right. Um, and then she rode um, an Albion. Okay. The saddle. Mm -hmm. And then her passion was side saddle like mine as well. We oh, really? We well, rode our side saddle. And so that was what she rode. And, and the side saddle actually created the least amount of pain for her. Now if I ride side saddle five minutes I'm hurting because I jumped mm -hmm. in it, I did raining in it, and I beat up my body doing side stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not really a healthy seat to ride. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Very hard on the body. So so she actually passed with lines and um, so that's kinda it. I mean it's she she was a uh, very dear friend. We were both very um, brought up as very um, military kind of environment, you know, with my grandfather and her father and my mother being a, a, a child raised up on the military bases. So, and back then, you know, Lee was very direct. Oh boy, was she honest, wonderfully <laughs> honest, but everybody was back then. Yeah. You know, it was, you know who, who I really enjoy a lot listening to that reminds me of how Lee and I were brought up and taught was George Morris. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you don't, you, you didn't question. You just listened and you did. Right. And so that's how we were brought up. Now I have learned, and I used to be firm like that too, but now times have changed. The culture has changed. So the right. teacher, I've had to find a, a softer way. Yes, it's it's really easy to scare people away with uh, if you're a confident bluntness. person, which I yes. tend to be pretty confident, if you know your art, you're very confident. Yes. You know, if you put me in front of a, a, a table full of counting books, I'd have been nervous wreck and I'd be very insecure <laughs> and terrified. Right. So, you know, so it's, um, but I, I, you know, at time, and she and I would spar over things. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then back, back in those days, you know, a phone call was seven cents a minute, long distance. 
Oh, so yeah. we had to do, a, you know, we would write or type, if anybody uh-huh. remembers what a typewriter is. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. We type letters back and forth, and once in a while, we'd be, we'd, if we had a little extra money, we'd, we'd make the long distance, big long distance phone call. <laughs> and we'd, we'd spar in discussion, I and mean, we had so much fun, because, you know, you can sit and you can um, spar and discuss and and try to push your point home on that other person, but it doesn't mean they have to take it, and that's the way we were, and so we really enjoyed that yes. with each other, you know, where other people, they'd get all offended and all that, I was like, eh. Right. <laughs> we write, we type letters back and forth to each other, making our point. <laughs> that's fantastic, wow. Oh, wow. yeah. I love that, but you're so right, because it's, it's so easy, and... I don't know so much if it's that that's become the times or that we've become so much more well connected to each other that we're just noticing it more. Um, you know, but it's easy to upset I people. Thought about. Yeah, I hadn't yeah. thought about that, but you just hit a point, a very good point. Yeah, there's so yeah. many people we're just, you know, we can touch several, potentially several thousand people in a single day because yeah. of the way we're connected, you know. It, it, it kind of reminds me of something somebody said to me the other day. They said, you know, there's not an over, excuse my French with this, but they said there's not an overabundance of assholes in the world. They're just strategically placed so that you meet at least one every day. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's wonderful. <laughs> but, but I think that, too, a lot about, you know, a lot about people that are very easily offended. It's not so much that there's more of them potentially. Maybe there are. I don't know. Uh, but you know, we just, we're, people are so much more accessible, you know, and we talk about all the bad things that happen in the world and how they never happened 50 years ago. Well, you know what? 50 years ago, we didn't know what happened in the next town until two weeks later. That's true. You know? That is so true. And the other thing is how we communicate because rather than looking each other in the face too. Yeah. So much we are corresponding quickly, instantly, shortly. Yes. yes. By a computer. Yes, exactly. Or a phone. Exactly. And so, so many times an emotion um, or a meaning can be misinterpreted. Now, yes. sometimes it's, there's no mis, you know, some people are really good at typing a whole lot, but <laughs> you get what they're saying. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but um, I think. We miss a lot of the, the, the true feel. We right. don't get the true feel of each other. Like when you're one on one with a horse, you're it's right there in front of you. <laughs> yes, it, well, exactly. It's right now. It's exactly. Right now. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much about that, and that can be th- that right now real from the horse can be challenging for the person. Oh, you know, to have to face our own garbage sometimes. You know, well, that's what helps you get to that place of being. Exactly. You exactly. gotta face your own garbage. You gotta get through it. You gotta be honest with yourself. Yes. Because if you're dishonest to yourself, then you're lying to everybody else. That's right. That's right. And you're lying to the horse. Yes. And there's so much about it that you know. I, I maybe I'm wrong, but I think to be a horse person, you have to be type A. Right, you have to kind of be that person who wants to get something done, who wants to take a little bit of charge. I mean, think about it. Horse ownership. You're trying to control the entire existence of another living being. That's like type A squared. Uh, but in order to in order to feel comfortable, in order to feel confident, in order to learn at their maximum capacity, the horse needs us to almost be the exact opposite of that. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like, you know, not only are we horse owners and we're type A people, but we're masochists because we beat ourselves up constantly over this internal struggle of taking control and then allowing the learning and taking control and letting it happen. And, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not one of those control freaks. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I'm just not going to, I'm just not like, you know, there is a point where like on my own property, if I see something wrong happening, man, I'm going to take control. Yes. Because it's going to infect it, in, in, it's 
going to affect the environment for my horses. Yes. And that I am so defensive of. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. But when I get out in public, I have a lot of tolerance. Yeah. You know, but but here it's like, no, at all costs, I'm going to protect this environment for my horses. People are not going to ruin my horse's environment. Yes. Well, and I and I recall seeing that at some clinics too. Um with with you and I don't I regret that I don't remember the situations but I do recall you coming in rather sharp on a couple occasions and really just taking oh, yeah. that control to help the horses which is yeah. you know it's, it's why we're in the business yeah yeah I can think I, I think of one one I don't know if you were at that one or not but I had, sometimes people don't listen and they have all these excuses and they've let the horses down and they've failed the horses. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get, uh, sometimes when the people just keep giving me feedback of junk, junk, junk and not listening and the horses suffering, suffering, suffering. Yeah. And I remember having this, I think it was a, I think it was a fossil phenol. I think that was at Ford City. And the one woman that had it had a broken arm. So the horse had broken her arm during the week. Oh, geez. Yeah, and um, the horse was just totally out of control and, and pushing all over them, and they were just blah, 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 and giving me this. And I finally had to take the horse, and I had to get – because there's nothing I hate more than getting big with a horse. Yeah, exactly. If I did not get big with this horse, this horse was going to take somebody out because he didn't know what – he didn't know what to do. He was right. so confused and so scared. Yep. And he was just trying to survive. Yes. And I had to get big with that horse. I mean, get so big with that horse. And he was up on his hind legs and everybody goes, oh, you know. Um, and then by the time I was finished, I had the horse away from, more away from the people, took the halter off him, and he was following me. Yeah. And I walked him up to these owners that still didn't have a clue. And I looked at him and I said, <laughs> that was pretty harsh. I said, you know, that was a $400 job I just did there. <laughs> <laughs> because they, they just were never going to get it. Yeah. And this horse was going to die. This horse was going to die because of it. That's what, when I get mad, is when people yeah. um, are going to, they still will not listen. They come for an instant fix. Yes. And you know that horse is going to be seeing a kill pen. Yes. You know it, and it's never the horse's fault. And that horse was so smart, he just wanted direction, he just wanted somebody to listen and somebody to help him. And it, in, what, 20 minutes, it happened. Yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, you know, and we can only hope that they picked up on that a little bit. Yeah, I know, I know they didn't. Right. You know, when you come home, I tell you, you come home and you cry a little bit about it. I know it. It's hard. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And yet, you know, I mean, it's it's probably the same thing my mechanic goes through every time I go in with the car, right? <laughs> because <laughs> because I, I joke all the time that if it doesn't wear hair, fur, fins, or feathers, I don't understand it in the least, you know? But And, and a friend of mine told me years ago that there's three kinds of people in the world. There's the kinds that get it. There's the kinds that are trying to get it. Yeah. And then there's the kind that are simply incapable of getting it, either presently or permanently. Yeah. And that's okay, too. You know, that's okay, too. But it's, yeah. I, every time I feel like there's somebody that's just not getting it, I think, you know, Patrick, that's kind of how you are with anything mechanical. <laughs> You just relate it to another field. Yeah, absolutely. Because I know I'm that way. And anytime I go in and I'm like, I don't know, John, the car's making this clunk, clunk, clunk noise, you know? <laughs> and he's like, oh, man, this guy just is never going to get it. He's going to ruin this car. <laughs> so, so there are people that look at us exactly the same way as we look at some people. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Oh, exactly. It's all balance. Balance. <laughs> yeah. It is a balance. It is a balance. <laughs> oh, 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 my gosh. What a great journey. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. 
Uh, I think, well, and I think it's so awesome to have been able to share this journey with you through all these years. And like I say, I mean, that, those quotes and those lectures that you gave have stuck with me all these years. So even though we haven't, you know, we haven't touched base as frequently as I would like, uh, it, it, you've, you've kind of been there on my shoulder very much throughout these, these years. So it's been fantastic. Oh my gosh, that's just a funny thing because I always keep saying with Lee being gone, I feel like I always can feel her on my shoulders. Mm, yeah. I have said that so many times. That's fantastic. That she, she's like, she's like, she's still here. She's still on my shoulder. We're still working this out together. She's, you know, helping me through all this. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad I've had some positive influence. Oh, <laughs> you sir, and I know you've had more than just a positive influence with me. You've had it with so many people, so yeah. many people. So it's well, been, so. Well, it's been so. so great. It's been so great. So uh, tell me a little bit about, because I know we can get into these stories and we could go for hours. Tell me just a little bit about uh, you being an amateur elephant trainer. I'm so I'm so curious to hear this. <laughs> well, um, you may not have known about the magazine, but there used to be a magazine, and the Gated Horse people will, because it's not been gone that long, called Gated Horse Magazine, and it lasted for 10 years. And Lee Ziegler and I both wrote for that magazine. And I got a call from the editor, um, Rhonda, um, asking if she could give my number to um, a, a guy who wanted to talk to me about my dotting up horses, the gated horses for a structure. So you would know mm. could, what gate they were going to do, mm -hmm. which I did for years. People aren't interested in it anymore, but I used to do it in every clinic. It's so funny because I do that now. I yeah. remember you doing that with the little sales stickers, and I've started doing that this year with different yeah. points on the horse to talk about collection and engagement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and lengths and proportions and angles and, yes. all, and all of that. And so, um, and it turns out this guy, it, he's, he's from San Francisco, and he went through the Vietnam War, and he was maimed in the war. And so rather than come back to the U.S. when it was so bad here for Vietnam vets, he stayed and went to Thailand. And so he is the, um, the um, one of the public relations, a big fundraiser, for the elephant sanctuary in Thailand, which is the government one. It's not a mm. tourist place owned by a private company. It, it's owned by the government of Thailand. It's a preserve for elephants. And when he came home for Christmas, one year he had family in Kentucky that had five gated saddlebreds. And they, he was telling them about the study that they were working on that they had to provide elephants and trainers for every November in Thailand. And so they showed him one of my articles in Gated Horse Magazine of dotting up the horses. And they said, you've got to see this. And so he called Rhonda. I said, yes, give him the number. He called me and said, would you be interested? We had the study going on with um, one scientist from Germany, one scientist from the Royal Veterinary School in uh, England, and they come every November and they bring all their force plate testing and we provide 40 elephants with their Mahoud trainers mm -hmm. um, to study biomechanics and locomotion of elephants. Now granted these two guys didn't like each other, but there was a huge amount of money donated for this project. And so I, would you like to come to Thailand and show them this and work with them? And I said, oh, I'd love to. <laughs> Although I was wow. scared to do that because I'd never been to a third world country before. Okay. And and so anyway, we, we had it all set up and then um, I got a call from him and he said um, they had a falling out and they're not coming to do the study, the two mm. researchers, the two professors. And, but they felt so bad about it, they said, would you like to come over and come and work with the elephants? I mean, the plane ticket and all that stuff was already done. Oh, so, gotcha. so we... Um, I got, so I got to have this amp, this elephant training program there. So they, and I said, well, can I bring Dave? <laughs> because I'm afraid of her. So Dave came and we went through two weeks of this elephant training program and we lived with the Mahout, the trainers. Yeah. 
And we had to work with these elephants and learn all of their, because the elephants heard, did not know English, they knew Thai. So we had okay. to learn Thai, and you had no saddles, no headgear, you were only using feet and legs and emotions and some terms in Thai. And so um, we got to, we had to go with them and do the shows every, we had to do two shows a day for the public because the largest elephant in the hospital in the world is there. Wow. So it's free to all the elephant owners and there's only um, uh, about 2,500 elephants left in that country. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so we had to learn all of this every day in the training ground so we could be part of the shows for the tourists because the tourists are what brought in money so they could do that. So we do oh, these two okay. shows, but we'd have to walk up in the jungle every morning. We had to walk through mountain jungle, poisonous snake, monkeys screaming in the trees, fire ant hills. <laughs> <laughs> we, and we had to go get our elephants because they would get put up in the jungle every night because they eat so much. So they'd be chained to trees because they big, long chains, but they had to be chained because there's still landmines in that country. Oh, right. And see, so there was already one elephant already in the hospital that had its leg blown off, and they were doing a prosthetic leg for it in that wow. because of the landmining. And those were the landmines from the Vietnam War? Or, yeah, from the wars. Yeah. Wow. So, so, and then we have to put that chain, we'd have to groom them there in the jungle, ask them to lay down, groom them, you know, and then work the chains over the neck and then get up on top of them, sit on those chains all the way down the mountain <laughs> to the training ground, which we were at all day, and we did these, and we'd have to bathe them on our way down because they need water to keep their skin moist. Uh-huh, right. And, and then we'd, um, the Mahouts would be helping us learn how to teach them and get our vocab, how to get them to lay down, how to bow, where you could do a vault run over there. You'd have to vault, you'd have to get way back and you'd have to run as fast as you could <laughs> and do a, like a handstand on their head and then get your legs over their ears. And then they get up and you'd have to turn around and face forward. <laughs> so we, and so we had to learn how to do all these mounts from them using their legs to help you with a set of stairs or vaulting or, or dismounting from the front of their faces. Um, I, we would have to pick up the elephant dung in the yard, so your elephant would take the trunk and pick up the, the, the dung cart because they actually had a paper factory, so all the elephant dung was made into paper shipped all over the world. Really? Wow. Yeah. It was fabulous. And so you'd be putting the dung in to go to the paper factory, and then you'd have to hose them off. So you'd get on your elephant, you know, and give them a, a, a verbal cue, and they'd turn on the faucet, give you the hose, so you could spray them. <laughs> wow. I mean, they, they played musical instruments. Oh, that's They actually fantastic. did work there where they were pulling and moving posts to create fencing. Mm. Um, there were big lakes there, you know, that you could take the elephants around to to um, walk, to swim in. I mean, it was um, quite an experience. And, uh, you know, I my elephant, because elephants um, get very attached to people. They're very loving. Mm -hmm. They're highly intelligent. They're yes. very emotional. And they get very connected. So every elephant has two mahouts. Mm -hmm. In case one has to go, there's always another one there. And they get very attached to them. Mm -hmm. And so I was, um, the, the really thing was that it, my elephant, Sing Kong, really taught me because she knew everything. I just had to learn everything to ask her to do things. Gotcha. But she was your schoolmaster. Yeah, there was one thing I taught her. Um, and she had been a logging elephant because uh, logging peak there is illegal. And so, so now, you know, there's a lot of elephants that are starving and, and dying in that, you know, in that country because people are still trying to keep them hurt privately. Um, and so she had been a logging elephant donated to the sanctuary. And she was very timid. And at the end of every show we would do, I don't know, there'd be 14 to 20 elephants, of, you know, with mahouts, and, and, and I was on Sincon. And at the end, one of the things to do was the tourists would pay money to get um, bananas. Okay. And, and feed the elephants. And so we'd give our elephants permission to go up to the fencing with these big bamboo um, steps and stuff, 
people would sit on, you know, seats in there. Mm-hmm. And my elephant was so timid, and she, she, she would always hesitate to be behind, you know, where all the other elephants, they, a lot of the other ones, they already knew it, so they were heading, when they were given permission, man, they were going for those bananas to give the, for the tour mm-hmm. to give them. Right, right. And, and she was very shy, and so that was my goal, was to make her get more, to become a beggar. <laughs> I'm really good at teaching my dogs to beg, too. <laughs> Teaching you for sure. She was really teaching me, and and we really we really hooked. It was very very hard. In the last day, I was there. She and I had really connected, and they let me go with her around the lake, just her and I. And she was um, trumpeting a lot, just this trumpeting, trumpeting. And I hadn't heard her do that. I heard her, you know, her purring because elephants will have mm-hmm. this purr and the mm-hmm. ears flap and. You know, and but she was doing this trumpeting, and I, I was I, I asked him, "Come, what's wrong?" He said, "He said you're." She said, "You're leaving." Aww. So this was, you know, there's so many stories, but it was it was quite an experience, and I, you know, I came back a better horse teacher from that. I'll bet. Yeah. It just, you know, it it just opened another door. Yes. To, to listen more and help more it just it just took me another step you know and it came at a time that i really needed it too isn't that the way that it works too isn't yeah, that amazing in its time for yes. a reason exactly yeah. 
Exactly. Oh gosh, that's awesome. So uh, I and I could listen to stories like this all evening, and we're we've just gone over two hours on our broadcast so far. Oh so, my gosh! I, right? I say that every time I do one of these, they've they've lasted for way longer than I ever anticipate that they will. And and I look up and I'm like, oh wow, we've been at it for quite a while. Um, would you mind if we take a couple quick questions from our online listeners? Oh, not at all. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I'll do my best. Great. I don't guarantee anything. <laughs> good, good. So we've got we've got a number of folks that have been listening the whole time here, and uh, Kathy sends in a message. I now own a Rocky and have never trained a gated horse, so I'm training him using low level dressage techniques and starting with self carriage. I'd like him to gate in a more natural frame with a snaffle rather than a shank to save his hocks. Is that possible? Oh. Yes, Kathy, I, um, usually around here, everything's in a snaffle, a side pole, or a pole Perfect, perfect. I, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you? Yeah, I did, I did, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it's, it's, the less is so much more with a gated horse, and as we've talked about, it's been about the emotion, and then guiding, supporting directly, only as much as you need to know more. And a shank bit, um, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time with the right instructor to learn and actually what I say, earn one. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because the shank bit is so much of a compound communication instrument. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's opposing pressures. Yes. And so when you have opposing pressures coming from different directions, especially if a horse hasn't been started in a snaffle or bit was first, mm -hmm. because we would never go to a curb until later. Right. You, know, I was, you earned your curb, and you used it because you really didn't need it. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yes. So it is absolutely possible, yes. yes. Just but it's not, I love the low-level dressage and the self-carriage, because I have so many gated horse people trying to get them to go to classical instructors rather than gated horse people first. Mm, yes. If they don't have a classical background, I really try to get them, if they, you know, to go, if a gated horse trainer does not have a classical background, I try to get them to go to a classical dressage instructor. You don't need gait for you to know anything about gait to teach the basics. Yep. Yep, that makes so much sense. Makes so much sense. Okay, so Cheryl sends in a question that is really interesting to me. Um, I've heard that Tennessee walking horses have become too walkerish. Do you feel this is true? I I don't under. Do you know what that means? Um, that's a new one on me. But you know what? Okay. There's new stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah I don't know what walkerish means. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I wouldn't know how to approach it because I don't know what it is. That's a new term for me. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, sorry, Cheryl. Hopefully, uh, yeah. hopefully, if you can send us in some more information on maybe what folks are meaning when they say walkerish, maybe we'll be able to yeah, give you a better some answer. Kind of, uh, definition of it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Let's see. So scrolling down. <clears throat> okay, so this is very interesting. So now, uh, and I know a little bit uh, just knowing background of how Western dressage has gotten started and now gated dressage getting started. This is a question from Shauna, and Shauna sends in, what is Ms. Graves' opinion of gated horse dressage tests? And forgive me, I don't know if they're tested under Western dressage or cowboy dressage, but they're well-designed tests, and the judges are... Uh, and are the judges experts in gated horse dressage? So what, what do you think about gated horse dressage? I love it. You know, I, I'm a big advocate. You know, I'm not a member. I'm not involved in the organization because I don't like organizations. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we have a wonderful one out there called Bosch, Friends of the Sound Horse. Yes. That did an amazing job in doing a gated dressage horse rule book. And I think you can actually purchase it. Um, I was part of, um, for a, with a whole bunch of people trying to develop that because Cowboy Dressage Organization had come to Bosch wanting to include gated horses in their program. Mm. And so, and what they had, we didn't accept because they didn't have anything. Ah, <laughs> uh, really, gotcha. Even okay. for regular horses, it just wasn't anything there at that point. It's changed now. Mm -hmm. um, it's really grown since then. 
So eventually they um, adopted the FOSH rules for the cowboy dressage um, and the test and that because FOSH did just a fabulous job and a job in defining and helping educate also through their rule book uh, and how to school for it. So they definitely have their place. I don't know anything about Western dressage. I just know about cowboy dressage, obviously, because of um, Jack Brainerd, who is okay. one of my childhood teachers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And, and so, and Jack's very involved in that. And I know that um, through the cowboy dressage, um, the gated horses have been so embraced now that they've got the rules and, and what it says. And gated mules. I mean, it has been mm. such a great place for the gated horses to go. And I, you know, and it's it's not. I think what's one of the things I like about it so much is I really like that it's not a letter pattern. You know, I have I have a um, a course up here too, a dressage course court up here on my property as well. But what I love about the cowboy part of it is that they put different obstacles and it, it, they really work on getting that horse relaxed and comfortable. It's not pushed, it's not hard. Right. It, it, it's really uh, human and horse friendly. And that's what I'm really, and they didn't used to be, but boy, it has come a long way. So there is definitely a place for it. Uh, um, and even, even if you have a gated horse that doesn't date, or even if you have a gated horse that drops, and guess what? It's okay to trot your gated horse because the gate's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a healthy posture um, as well. And a conditioning posture if it's done in a proper collective trot. Mm -hmm. um, but I have seen some really good gated horses that also had nice trots um, put through traditional dressage courses, you know, training levels. Oh, I can think of um, Diane Sept, who, who was wonderful. She's a clinician mm -hmm. who was wonderful at doing that and, and really had great success in doing that. And these horses did great. So there is a place you just have to, you know, you, I don't know if it's in your own backyard, but if it's not in your backyard, get, get something going. Yes, you absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And I know yeah, I've got a number of students uh, in fact, I have one barn that is really, uh, really active with Western dressage. Uh, so not the cowboy dressage, but the Western dressage through primarily through North American Western dressage, an organization that does a lot of virtual shows. So you can basically ride your test at home and submit it to be judged in their competitions. Uh, That's how they do it in Canada. So yeah, Western right. In Canada has done that way because I have a lot of Canadian clients that do compete their Western dressage in that. Yep. They don't have cowboy dressage up there. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So I've, I've got a lot of students uh, that are competing their gated horses in the Western dressage. And it, yeah, they're loving it. They're loving it. It's yeah, great stuff. Yeah, so definitely, folks, we belong in dressage. Absolutely. <laughs> With our gated horses, no question. There is a place for us. Absolutely. Awesome. Great. Okay, so Kelly sends in, I have a Rocky Mountain mare and her filly that I took in on a rescue situation. The mare is very trotty. She's more bumpy than my quarter horse. She will not gate, but her filly is so naturally gated. Just goes along so smooth. I, ca I cannot get my Rocky to gate at all. Is there situations that a Rocky will not ever be able to gate? I've had others ride her as well and no change. Okay. So I, I don't know without seeing the horse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, if the, the filly has got, you know, a real natural easy um, gate right now, it could be because, oh my gosh, we get some of these in here too, um, that are on the opposite end. All they do is pace. Mm, okay. Instead of trot. And to break up the pace, it takes a ton of work. Same with some of these hard trotting horses. So that tells me, in my opinion, that I still got to see the horse's structure, because that would help me a lot. But a lot of times, it's the previous training. So they have rewired the horse. It doesn't mean the gate isn't there, but it's buried so deep. Mm. The nervous system has rearranged to trot. That's what that horse thinks it's supposed to do, and it's afraid maybe to do something else. You know, gotcha. just like some of the gated horses, the show walkers, 
that were only two gate horses and they were not allowed to canter and you try to go and teach them how to do a canter and they're terrorized to canter because they weren't allowed to. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, I, I can only help so much, but, you know, if the filly has got a really strong gait, something, something's happened to that horse, and you just got to get with the right person. Mm-hmm. You've got to get with the right person that can help you. Mm-hmm. For sure. So that's actually going to bring me into a question that I had written here separately from, uh, actually, from my Facebook group, the Patrick King Horsemanship uh, discussion group. Uh, there was a gal who posted a message about a standard bred, a rescued standard bred, who had been driven on the track uh, and then was an Amish cart horse for a while and now belongs to, I believe, if, if I remember the post correctly, belongs to some friends of hers and they're struggling to get the horse to canter, which makes perfect sense. I mean, I, I grew up actually with a uh, standard bred track um, spent a little bit of time working there as well. So, uh, and of course, with the cart horses, generally they don't want them to be cantering. Um, so their post oh, they was won't, they won't let them at all. That's right. That exactly. Is a bad thing. Exactly. That's <laughs> that's them. bad news. Right. Exactly. That's very bad news in the in the buggy. Uh, so now, but these folks are interested in helping the horse or encouraging the horse to canter. And they're running into a lot of challenges with the horse because of course, anxiety is coming up and things like that because basically it's been told its whole life it's not allowed to when there's a human involved, right? So so what's your opinion on that? Is that something, is, is there a time when you draw the line and you say, look, I'm just not gonna put the horse through this? Yeah, you know, if the horse gets emotionally to the point where it's falling apart and dangerous, I wouldn't put the horse through it. But okay. if it's not, and you can really get a sense that the horse just doesn't know how to do it with a person on its back, yet you've got a relationship and it's willing to give you a try, I'd take a horse like that and I'd trail ride it in a place where they've got a lot of hills. Okay. And just let that horse open up and, and get over it a little bit in a forward seat and mm-hmm. joyfully say, Oh, let's go. Come on, baby. Let's go and mm-hmm. see if you can get that horse to canter up a hill because it, yep. and then when it does, good boy, good girl, you know, and all positive and just, I mean, make a huge fuss and make their emotions feel good about what they just did. Yes. So, you know, you have to get, again, you kind of have to get your hands on the horse to know what emotions are there. Mm-hmm. and um, what can't be done and what could be done with the right work. Yes. And standard breads can are just fine. <laughs> Absolutely, right. But, they're, right. but they're, you know, some of them have been said, no, you cannot, and they're, mm-hmm. they're terrorized of it because they're afraid what's going to come. Right, exactly, because as far as they know, that's wrong. So that makes perfect sense. Put them in a situation where it becomes a happy accident. A happy accident, yeah. exactly. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, uh, Pam wants to know, and she's been uh, she's been very patient and persistent with this. She sent in the question a couple of times. She wants to know: Have you ever seen or ridden a McCurdy Plantation horse? I believe that's one of the horses you mentioned early on in the broadcast. Is that right? Yes, I've, I've had some come in for training, and um, you know what they are: Tennessee walking horses. I don't care what their their <laughs> Website says. Oh, really? <laughs> a lot of propaganda there is being something unique in the swamp horse and that. They have a walking horse background, and you find um, uh, a, I've had some that are really hard pacers, I've had some that are really hard trotters, um, and some of them that actually will fox trot, some that will run mm-hmm. walk, um, some that will saddle rack, some that will fox rack, do a diagonal saddle rack. Oh. Um, so it's quite a mix because there's just been a lot of horses mixed within this history. There's nothing, you know, but it originally was more of a walking horse start, but it's been a lot of delusion and it's been the association owned by one family, controlled by one family, um, and not had a lot of luck with them knowing what the gates are either <laughs> trying to get the horses certified. Gotcha. Okay. So I would assume okay. this would be the McCurdy family then if it's the McCurdy exactly. plantation horse. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Does that mean politics and ego are involved? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. See what happens when we get at beyond the two hour mark of this, you know, filters start yeah. to come off. Um, that's very interesting. So then that's a breed and that's one that I'd not heard of until, uh, until you mentioned it earlier and then Pam reminded us of it. Um, yeah, they started their own registry. Gotcha. Um, so originally it was the Tennessee they, walkers and then, and, and now they've become infused. So they're more of an amalgamation of, of a few different right. breeds. Okay. Yeah, so you get a lot of variables. Gotcha. Okay. And I would assume, uh, particularly in the early, uh, in the early lineage of a breed that's a mix like that, you're going to have quite a few different gates presented within each generation. Right, and that's, oh, what a good point, Patrick, because we do every single gated breed we have, we see horses that will do multi-gates or not do the signature gate. Who picks the signature gate? People do. Mm. And, and not all horses will do the signature gate of their register what's on their registration paper. You know, it doesn't matter that we see we see all the gates through all the breeds. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh my goodness. This has been so much fun, Liz. It has. It's been a blast. <laughs> is, and I've got how much time we've been talking about. I know, right? I've got <laughs> And, and I know you and I, we both make a living talking, so we could probably go on for way longer. Yeah, for a week. <laughs> right? Right? Oh, my goodness. This is, this is fantastic. So um, I, I'm ready to go into my wrap-up questions, unless there are any topics that we haven't touched on that, uh, that you would like to hit. No, not that I can think of. Okay, perfect. I'll probably think of them later tonight. Before I go to sleep. <laughs> right. Well, we can we can certainly do this again. You know, 2017 is almost finished. So, yeah, it's time. It's time. <laughs> perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, let me think here. Our wrap up questions. If there was one specific thing that you could recommend for riders to focus on as a primary means of improving their horsemanship, what would that be? Working on their own emotions. Wow, that was that was easy. You had that one right on the tip of your tongue. I love it. Yep. Okay. All right. I if, think that if everything you are, you take to the horse. That's so true. That is so true. If you could ride with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Can I name two? You can name as many as you want. One, one past and one present? You bet, definitely. Okay. One past would be to ride with Nuna Oliveira, mm. who I study insanely. Yes. And am a student of one of his students, um, actually. Which and one? I would love to have ridden with him. Um, and then oh. um, I would love to ride with Manuel Menendez. Mm, yes, Manolo. Absolutely. I love his work. <laughs> I That's just, fantastic. I just love his work. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So you said that you ride with a, you ride with a student of Nuno's. Who was that? I did. His name was Armand Baca from Peru. Okay. And he's a, a, a Sir Armand Baca, and he is from Peru. And his father, there's even probably some old videos online, would have um, Nuno go down to Peru and teach often. Gotcha. Um, as Nuno, as um, as Armand was a youngster. And then Iman now lives in the U.S. Um, and he's in California and works a lot with Peruvians, but he's done bullfighting horses. And I spent some time with him up in Edmonton, Canada, because I'd heard of his background. And to watch him work um, at a big place called Rancho Serrano okay. up in um, Canada, and we traded. And so he wanted to know about the other gated horse breeds, and I wanted mm. to know about many Peruvians because I was showing Peruvians then, so many of them. And so we traded, and I, you know, stayed up in a little tiny room up there while they, he and his wife were up there on kind of a hiatus from the industry. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. um, and she was an Andalusian trainer, amazing Andalusian trainer. Wow. And we'd be up till 3 o'clock in the morning talking about our problems, <laughs> trying to do with the people part of it and working horses all day. And I can tell you, he's the one man that I, you know, watching him work, I'd be crouched down and sitting on, you know, sitting on my foot 
on the ground watching him work, you know, cold or something in the, in the round pen there. And I, you feel tears coming down your face. Yeah. Because you've never seen anything so beautiful. That's fantastic. And so touching, and I thought, and, and to this day, I, now that I've studied um, Nuno for so long and, and got as much of his work as I've been able to get my hands on, I've got tons of it here. Um, he was he was teaching as he was taught by Nuno. Mm. The emotional part of it was um, so, and and he really gave me my hands. Also, you know, oh. I thought my mother gave me my hands, but. Herman gave me my hands. He um, he made me instead of just having hands. He made my hands ears. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, I love I love um, the sound of that. Yeah. So now I'm just such a you know freedom of hands things. Don't go there until you have to. Yes. You know, and when you do, ask as little as possible. Right. Right. You know, protect that's that head, awesome. protect that sacred head. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's awesome to hear you say that. We're actually gearing up. Uh, these broadcasts are going to take about a six-week hiatus, as a matter of fact, because I'm heading to Portugal in January. You're going to be spending about oh. six weeks with Nuno Oliveira's old partner, Luis Valencia, uh, uh-huh. in, in Portugal. So that's going to be so fantastic. I, I have to ask, is the old arena, has that place been sold, or is he still working there? I can't answer that question yet. I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't know. Well, uh, you know, take pictures of that, because I know absolutely. his old arena, because I have so many videos of it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, we're hoping... So uh, I watched a lot of his work done in that arena. Awesome. It was a magical place. I'm sure. So the hope is that we're going to still be sharing videos and photos uh, at, while yeah. we're there. Hoping to do some live videos, actually, while we're there learning. That would be awesome. And you know Mark Russell was a student of Nuno. Yes. Our, our great Mark Russell, who we lost last year. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If, he was, if he was around, I'd want to ride with him, too. <laughs> mm, he was he was such he a was, great man. Such a great yeah, man. Good great friend man. of mine. Huge, yes. huge loss. To everybody, I'm telling you, a huge loss. Absolutely, absolutely. And his wife, Hela, uh, is working on a new addition to his book, Lessons in Lightness. And oh, you're kidding. No, yes. she's, yeah, Mark was working on a revision, and she's working to finish that revision, and she's also working through several hundred hours of video footage of lessons um, to oh, hopefully so put out some more of Mark's work. Yes. This yes. is so good to hear. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's exciting. That's yes. so exciting. Absolutely. It's it's quite a task. I can't even imagine trying to tackle it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, she's she's working very hard on that. Yeah. Awesome. So, oh, cool. Awesome, awesome stuff. It. That's good to hear. That's the best news of the month. Oh, good. Well, I'm so glad to have been able to give that to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Good, good. Okay, so what is your present personal definition of horsemanship? Oh, you stuck me on that one. Oh, that one gets everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, re, re, read that again. Okay. Re say it again. Okay, because I know it changes, right? It's fluctual. What oh, is constantly. your. Yeah, what is your present personal definition of horsemanship. I'm still stumped. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You got another four hours. Oh, well, I mean, I do, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I think actually, I think Facebook kicks us off after four hours. So, you know, we've got another yeah. hour and a half to go. <laughs> Gosh, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I mm. feel like for me, you know, some really crazy things have happened to me here in my own journey. So kind of let me explain why I'm at this place and I can't answer this. Is, you know, I grew up in the show ring, mm-hmm. you know, showing for my mother's clients and for my mom, and then went on my own and showed as a professional for clients for many years and getting all the judges' cards and all that. And um, when I came off the road as a professional exhibitor, there was a a freedom, a little bit of a freedom that happened, a little bit, 
that happened inside of me because now I didn't have to I didn't have to ride for the show ring. I didn't have to have all these contrived feats for all these different disciplines I rode and different briefs um, I rode gated or not for what the new uh, the current image was that the judges wanted to see in the show ring. Mm. And so I didn't have to do that anymore. And then when um, there was a t so all I had to do was train the horses that came in here. I didn't have to train them because I was taking them to a show ring. Yeah. So there was a little bit of freedom. But then, um, so, and it, it kept kind of growing a little bit here. But then, oh, what has it been, six years ago, there was a, something that became really freeing. And this was when I was, um, it was myself, Jack Brainerd, and Richard Schrake, who was a longtime mm. old friend, too. Mm -hmm. And we were working a horse fair together. And we were sitting around one evening eating dinner together in a hotel. And we were talking about the judges, our judges' lives, you know. And I was the baby of the group because I'd only been judging for like 32 years. Oh. You know, Jack had been judging for with many, many cards and same with Jack and Richard, you know. So you're t t t probably talking 55 years with Richard and 60 wow. years or 65 years with Jack combined. Well, three of us sitting there and we were talking about what the show world had done and what had happened and how miserable we were. We hated mm -hmm. the politics, we didn't like the rules, we didn't like what was happening with the horses, we were seeing the torture in the horses' eyes and their bodies. And so that year the three of us decided together, we're not judging anymore. Mm. We gave up all our cards. Wow. And when we did that, I know for me when I did that, it was like this huge explosion of freedom happened for me. Because now I could do anything the way I wanted to do it and not held hostage by any rules, by any other people's opinions. I could just train and teach people and do clinics because it helped me through my clinics too. Yeah. Um, in my philosophy that worked for me one-on-one -on -one in what I do here at home. And so I guess I'm still finding that definition of horsemanship for me because I'm still finding it myself now that I have this freedom. Yeah. No, that makes that perfect makes sense. sense. It makes perfect sense to me. Yes. So it's been... So, okay, there's your answer. <laughs> I love it. That's good. That's great, though. That's great. And, that you know, that speaks very much to how things change as we grow, as we evolve, as we find new understandings, and, and in this case, new freedoms, right? You know, do you know the story of Boucher? Have you studied any of his work? I know a few stories of Boucher, yeah. Okay, well, that what you just said really relates to a story that resonates so much to me with him, and everybody knows this story, if they've done any study or know anything about him, but, you know, his um, pre-accident work was brutal. Mm. Yes. He was a circus entertainer, mm -hmm. and the cavalry, the German and the French cavalry wouldn't even take his methods. Right. They rejected him. Right. What we now refer to had, as Boucher's first manner, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then he had the accident where the chandelier came down on mm -hmm. him in a horse and named him. Yes. And so he was maimed, and he, and he changed his ways. Because and he was the one who who quoted hands without legs, legs without hands. Yes. And so their life experience, um, and, and maturity, and deep thought, and reality checks that make you fix your insides, mm -hmm. um, bring you to better, bigger places. You know, some, I feel like so much right now is I'm just getting, in so many ways, I'm just getting started. Mm, I love that. I love that. So, because I have so much now I want, I can do my way. Yes. You know, the way that the horses tell me it's okay. Yes. You know, that reminds me of, of the quote from my mentor, Ray Hunt. He, he would say, oh, you know, it yeah. takes a lifetime to learn how to live a lifetime. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <It really does. laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, and it's over too quick. Right? Oh, my yeah. goodness. Um, but use it wisely. Don't use it frivolously. <laughs> for sure, right? For sure. You know, that's, that's where people go wrong. They yep. get a little upset when people say, oh, you know, they're 50s and 60s. I haven't decided what I want to be yet. And I'm like, okay, lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> get on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time to grow up. Yeah, for sure. Oh, gosh, that's awesome. Okay, so what book are you currently reading, or what was the last book that you read? Oh, well, there's one that I spend a lot of time in Okay. right now for because of the lesson plans in it. Now, it's really inexpensive, and it's a rare book. It's hard to find, but I pick this book up all the time, and it's called Horses and Riders. By Nuno Oliveira, mm, mm-hmm. and then there's only it's only 110 pages, and he and it's all about his lesson plans when because he would go to Australia and teach often, and that's where he passed away. Mm-hmm. Also, but it's full of his lesson plans, and so these lesson plans really work really well for me here, especially since I have a really uh, a classical arena. Okay. Um, and, but I will warn you, this book is 370. Five to four hundred dollars when you can find it. When you can find it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but when the when the economy gets bad or people like around Christmas and that, you might be able to find a copy because they're mm-hmm. um like ABE books. Look at Amazon, and this book I go to so often because of the lesson plans. Okay. And so you know, teaching here all the time, and I, it's one of my. I, you know, I have. Some really expensive books, but this one is one of my um, all-time favorites. And I take care of it, but I read it a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to be looking for that one. I have the uh, what is the one that I have? Reflections on Equestrian Art. I have. I know I have that one. Oh, I think I have that one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. They have. Uh, it's also on an audio book now. I spend so much time driving. There's a lot of a lot of the books have been transferred to audio book. Um, like yeah, I think I to audio books all the time, but yeah. I'm just not, you know. And I'll tell you another one that I really, we could talk books forever because I have a monstrous <laughs> library here. That's awesome. Um, but there's another one I recommend to people all the time um, because of the less, again, the lesson plans in it. Mm-hmm. And so it's got a lot of images of what's the right shape, what's the wrong way to do something, and it's called um, the workbook from the Spanish Writing School, oh, yeah. 1951, by yep. Charles Harris. Yep. And he took all his notes and put it out in the back of this book. It's a biography. It's fascinating. Anyway, he was a very interesting man. Mm-hmm. But I love all of his notes here. It's so clear. Anybody can understand it. And yes. he did drawings to go with it. And this is another really great book for references for doing homework. Yes, you know, exactly. I'm a homework person. We all have homework. Yes. Yes, that's a book actually that was shared with me at a clinic I was teaching in New York, a clinic host of mine. Uh, I believe it was given to her as a gift, and she shared that one with me last time I was there. It is a fantastic book. It is a fantastic book. Yeah. It's excellent. And then um, my third backup I really like is um, Thomas Ritter's book that he put out because it's good. It's a good teaching book in the way he laid it out. Okay. Um, and it's called Dressage Principles Based on Biomechanics. Oh, nice. He, he did such a good job because it gets it starts people from the beginning, no matter what level you are, and gets you all the way through. And he is such an exceptional teacher. Yes. And he's not in the U.S. anymore. He's back in Germany. But he's right. putting out great material. He is, absolutely. And he's doing a lot of online stuff now. I've seen a lot of he Facebook broadcasts and things. Yeah. 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 I follow all his online stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Seems master, like great stuff. A new age master that is still alive. Yes. Right. You right. Know? Somebody to look up for sure. We got to cherish them. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Speaking of, how can folks find you? Oh. That's easy. <laughs> you can, um, I have a website at um, www.lizgrace.com. Or okay. is it .com? Yeah. And also um, .org. I also own the thing lizgrace.org. Perfect. And then um, you can find me on Facebook. 
um, you can email me at um, lizgrace at centurycal.net. You can call me at 346-2422. That's my landline here. I'm not a big cell phone person. Actually, mine's been off for quite a while now for oh, days here. That's <laughs> very generous of you to give that out. That, uh, there's yeah, There's yeah. been well, hundreds of people family. listening to this that might bump yeah. in and call you. <laughs> yeah, but I... I have always said at the end of my clinics, you know, I, I, and Lee and I, this is something about Lee and I that was, you know, she and I were working so hard because when we got into the gated horses, we were so much just, well, well what are, she and I would ask, well, what's the gate? What, what's this What's this mean? What the horse is doing? Why does this mm -hmm. happen? And the old timers in the South would say, well, just get on and go. Well, that told us nothing, especially to brainiacs like we are right you know and, and so that was our search for knowledge and to define it and make it easy and get this information out here for people to learn that yeah. they could do it and so I've always said at the end of my clinics you know I, I'm not your psychiatrist <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a horse question or there's anything I can do to help and I may not have the answers, but maybe we can find somebody that does. Yeah. Call me or contact me and we'll work on it. That's fantastic. So we're not alone in this together. Right. Nobody should feel alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Especially with the ease of communication anymore. I mean, yeah. look, we're what, a 14 hour drive apart and we're doing this yeah. broadcast here. I mean, there was a time when that was six months in a wagon and half of our families would die of dysentery, right? And <laughs> yep, that's the way it was. Right, exactly, and, and we're able to do this now, and we have people, I'm sure of it, we have people logged in right now listening from all over the world to what we're doing here. So the world is big, it's global, and it's tiny all at the same time, you know, so. Um, yeah, and just yeah. As, as long as we can just keep networking to help everybody, we can help. Exactly. And you know, the other thing that I, I you know, is kind of, I got to put out here is, none of us are experts. We're all students. Right. We are right. all students, every one of us. So be careful if you put yourself out there as an expert and don't understand you're a student. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're dead in the water. Yep. You're just done. You stopped. Here's the stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the ones who claim they're experts, those are probably the ones to stay away from. You know? Uh, yep. <laughs> That's, Ray used to say that. Ray Hunt used to say that to us. He'd say, you know, if somebody came to me to a clinic and they brought a horse and they said that they were a trainer, I would guess the horse was in trouble. If they came to me and they said they were a professional trainer, I knew their horse was in trouble. In trouble. <laughs> That's when, when people come here to my bar and they give me this whole still, oh, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I'm like, right off, I know we got a problem. Yep, absolutely. Because they're trying to sell themselves yes. instead of asking questions. Yes. You know, instead of giving me a sell, Ask questions. Yes. You know, and, and let's share ideas and, and, and experiences. Yes. That's horsemanship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh gosh. And we don't and we don't have to agree. No, and that's where people get offended if they don't agree with someone or if someone doesn't agree with them. I think the best conversations I've had with people have been the people that don't agree. And we can both yeah. own the fact that we don't agree, and we talk yeah, about things. Own it. And, yeah. yeah, you know, own yeah. it without the baggage. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Be okay, and then like Lee and I do, type a letter to each other later. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Or you know, anymore it would be I got blocked on Facebook, and you know. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, I have to confess, I have a ton of people blocked us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't we... want to unfriend them because I don't want to offend them, but if they're obnoxious, yeah. or if they live in a world of constant politics, yeah. I, don't, I, I, have to hold, I don't want that baggage in my head. I just want to talk horses. I get it. Oh, I totally get it. I've gotten to the point where it's bad. I shouldn't even admit this, but... I've gotten to the point where I'm really fast at unfriending people on Facebook because I got to the point a couple months ago, Facebook told me I had a limit and, and, and then I reached, it said that I reached my limit and I said, well, 
who the hell really has 5,000 friends, you know? So it's like when I see some stuff that shows up that's just really ridiculous, I'm like, yeah, okay, I gotten really quick at clicking that unfriend button. Yeah, and I screen. I mean, even before I friend anybody new, yeah. I screen. If I don't see a horse, yeah. oh, exactly. family, I don't exactly. friend them. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. And and I, I shouldn't even admit this, but I've got, like, in the friend request queue, I've probably got, like, 60 friend requests, you know. And it's like, oh, man, i I got to take the time to look through that and see who I know. Oh, I see, and... Yeah. No, I get on that right away because I get, I'm always afraid of hackers. So I just, like, you uh, know, yeah. I get, like, if they don't have a horse or I don't, I don't know them, yep. you know, yep. I'm... I just immediately decline. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Has has your account been hacked yet? It seems like so Not many yet. have. No, good. I'm so careful. I, yeah. I, I, maybe tomorrow I will be, but I'm just right. so careful. Yeah, I had someone send me a screenshot. Oh, this was months ago, maybe even a year ago, uh, of someone who had sent them a friend request, and it was a photo of my daughter and I, actually. <gasps> It, it was like my account had been hacked or copied or got, whatever. Yeah, they got it. Yeah. Somebody by a totally yeah. different name, and it, yeah, it was interesting. So, and Facebook is great at handling that, and, and the person was dealt with immediately. So it was, uh -huh. you know, it was great. But well, it's good to know they're good at handling it. I haven't had that situation yet, but if I, if I oh, I mean, it was now I know. like within 15 minutes that person didn't even exist anymore on Facebook. It, it was awesome. yeah, it was super fast. I was super super pleased with with how they handled it. So yeah. okay, so all right, next question, and this is the question that I love. This is my favorite question on these broadcasts. So almost every time I do a video or a broadcast like this, we do a question of the day where I ask the question for our audience. Our audience gets to answer the question of the day, and it's usually it's just random stuff that pops into my head. But when I have a Fun. It is so much fun. So when I have a guest on, the guest gets to ask the question of the day. So now I'm going to throw the ball in your court. What is okay. our question of the day? Okay. So this is going to get complicated. Oh, good. Yeah. Because the question of the day for each person is going to be different. So this is what I want. I want them to ask themselves a question of, what is my next goal for myself with my horse? Mm. And everybody will have a different one, but what is my goal with myself and my horse? I love that. I love that. And what a perfect way to wrap up our last broadcast, actually, of 2017. Awesome. I love it. This is a blast. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. So, gang, if you're out there listening, you've got Liz's question of the day. What is your goal for yourself and your horse? We want to hear that. I know I'm going to be checking in. I imagine Liz is going to be checking in to see what your answers are. Give your answers to that in the comments section below this video. Liz, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. It has been wonderful. What? Gosh, I feel like we've been sitting in the same room. Uh, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just think how long we'd go if we were. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The so one thing is keep doing these. Keep getting all these wonderful people you've been oh, getting thank you. to do these because they're, they're, they're just so valuable. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much. And this has been officially, I'm going to give you this one, Liz, this little insight. Uh, we're now at over two hours and 47 minutes. This has been the longest talking about horses broadcast that I have done. I thought Warwick Schiller and I could talk for a long time, but you know, you and I have beat that record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. You're getting close to my mother and I usually was no no less than three or four hours and it was horses for three to four hours. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you you you've entered that, that family circle there. Perfect. Perfect. Well it's nice to be part of such a good family that way. I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh great. Oh well, great. You have a good evening and I hope Everybody out there has a good evening, and we gave them some food for thought. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you so yeah. much.
and we'll be in touch. You to come this way when you get this way. Perfect. I look forward to that. I will be in touch, and we will, uh, yeah, we're going to make that happen. Okay. So, Super. Great. All right. You Bye. have a great evening. Uh-huh. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, gang, I want to thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 22 of Talking About Horses. I really appreciate you giving Liz and I your ear. Please remember that if you've missed any of it, you can access this full broadcast through Facebook, YouTube, or by streaming from iTunes. Through whatever platform you're listening, please be sure to give us a rating, a comment, a review, and a share. Your word of mouth is the fuel for this fire. Next week is part of the Christmas holiday, so I'll be enjoying that with family, as I hope you all will be also. As 2017 comes to a close and 2018 rolls in, I'm booking guests for this broadcast and would love your recommendations. Who would you like to hear from here on Talking About Horses? Send me your requests, either in a comment on this broadcast or by email to office at pkhorsemanship.com. Thanks so much, gang.